Chicago Bears of the NFC Central Division. The Minnesota Vikings, NFC Central Division. It's been 32 years of brutal football. a bigger than life type of game experience for both of us. It was the most intense game that we played, the most physical game we played. I always look forward to playing them. I guess they had respect for us because they knew where they're gonna come in the game, they're gonna they're gonna get hit. They last met a month ago. The Bears carried a 20 to nothing lead into the fourth quarter, but this interception after a Jim Harbaugh audible sent Chicago Bears coach Mike Ditka into a sideline ring. Two more Viking touchdowns gave him a one-point victory. Now tonight, the lead in the NFC Central Division is on the line as the Minnesota Vikings fight once again with the Chicago Bears on ABC's Monday Night Football. Familiar skyline of Chicago, Illinois on a blustery, windy city evening. Cool and damp rain expected. And another familiar landmark, Soldier Field, and it will be sold out tonight as the Chicago Bears take on the Minnesota Vikings in a key NFC Central Division matchup. Hello again, everyone. I'm Frank Gifford with Al Michaels and Dan Durdorf. We're glad you are with us tonight. A perfect setting for this NFC matchup, and it doesn't get any better in the NFC Central. The Bears and the Vikings playing for the lead in the division. The Bears coming into tonight. They are 4-3. and three. They're not very happy with that record. They can't get out of their minds that loss to Minnesota four weeks ago when they led by 20 points going into the fourth quarter. They'd like to reverse that tonight. And, of course, the Bears and their head coach, Mike Ditka, are awash in a sea of controversy here in Chicago, but they know. If they win tonight over the five and two Vikings who have done so well under new head coach Denny Green, they will be tied for the division lead. And Al, if you look down the line at the schedule, the rest of the schedule would favor the Bears over the Vikings. It would. Well, you know, you mentioned Denny Green, and he is the key, Frank. Dennis Green, the rookie coach, has come in like a whirlwind right off the bat. He got rid of people like Wade Wilson, Herschel Walker, Keith Millard, and perennial all-pro Joey Browner. Brought in some new faces and a brand new attitude. 4-0 in preseason. They outscored the opposition 140 to 6. And that sent the message. And they picked right up during the regular season. Even if they lose tonight, they'll still be tied with the Bears. But if they win, they'll be two games in front of the standings and, in effect, three games in front because they will own the tiebreaker advantage and they'll have clear sailing to the Central Division title. Dan, on the flip side, it's a big game for Minnesota. It is a humongous game for the Chicago Bears. With a capital H, Al, and you touched upon the standings and what happens to the Bears win or lose tonight. But that's on the football field. Let's talk about what this game means to the city of Chicago. Uh, th this is such a proud city and the Bears and in many ways just embody everything that this city stands for. Uh, you have to look at last year even though the Bears were 11 and 5 they were deposed as NFC Central Division champs by the Detroit Lions. Now this year the challenge is from the Minnesota Vikings and, and the people here in Chicago sense that an era of domination is slipping away. And of course at the very foundation of all of this is their coach Iron Mike Ditka who's under siege by the fans and and sometimes himself as he's openly said this might be my last year if ever a city and a team needed a win tonight it's the Chicago Bears and this crowd is prime as usual a sellout Soldier Field capacity a little bit more than 60,000 it poured all day yesterday, part of the day today. It's dry at the moment. They expect rain later. Ditka in his 11th season as the head coach of the Bears. It's a swirling wind at Soldier Field. 
basically tonight coming out of the south or right to left at about 20 miles per hour. Minnesota to kick off. Quad Reves to send it down to Dennis Gentry and Darren Lewis. And the kick comes down to the nine-yard line and right off the bat, Darren Lewis turns and hands the ball to Anthony Morgan, but that doesn't fool Vinci Glenn. Vinci Glenn expecting it and right there to knock him down deep in Chicago territory. So a little trickery on the opening return for Chicago, but Minnesota equal to the task. Jim Harbaugh has come off that Minnesota disaster with two of the best games in his career back-to-back. -back. Anderson and Muster are the starting running backs. Davis and Waddle, the wideouts. Keith Jennings, the tight end. Thornton is still on injured reserve. The rookie from Cal Ozine is the left tackle with Ports. Fontenot, the center, and the veterans, Thayer and Van Horn on the right side. First and ten, Bears from the 13-yard line. Out of the eye with Anderson taking it up to the 22-yard line. So they begin with a gain of nine on their first play from scrimmage. And here is the Minnesota defense, a great front four. Noga, Thomas, Randall, and Dolman. Dolman has eight and a half sacks. Jenkins and Merriweather on the outside, and Del Rio, the former Cowboy, in the middle doing a good job. Lee, the veteran, with McMillan on the corners. Scott taking Browner's spot, and Wright are the safeties. And it has started to rain. Second down, two at the 21-yard line. Out of a split back set this time. It is Muster picking up the first down, taking it to the 29-yard line. And the Bears this year, who've gone more to the pass than ever before, still go back to the basics and begin by establishing their running game. There's the rain coming down. And you alluded to the Minnesota defense, Al. It is a very quick defense. They are not very big up front. They play great on artificial surface. But on a wet field, and this one could get wet very quickly, they would be not quite as effective as they are in the artificial surface. The Bears are kind of counting on that. Mike Ditka says Soldier Field is thick, this surface. And let's see how they play on it. This is Jennings in motion. First and 10 from the 29-yard line. They give it to Anderson again. Big hole through the middle. Up to the 33-yard line. Tackled by Merriweather. Gain of four. Second and six. This is obviously what the Bears would like to do. They'd like to control this game on the ground. Over the past year and a half or so, they've had to go much more to the pass game because their running game wasn't as effective. Watch Mike Merriweather, former Pittsburgh Steeler, who is once again reunited with defensive coordinator Tony Dungy, the defensive coordinator for the Vikings, and he is a great football player. Had those all pro years so many times with the Pittsburgh Steelers under Dungy. Opening drive of the game, second and six. Light rain. And out of split backs again, this is Anderson. And he takes it up to the 37-yard line. McMillan makes the tackle with Merriweather. So twice they've come up in the eye, twice in split backs. Four plays on the ground, third and short. And I don't know that Mike Ditka could orchestrate a beginning to his offensive game plan any better than this has started tonight. The Chicago Bear offensive line, which oh, is, a, is a little banged up and certainly a year older. This is a group that's been around for a long time. Bayer, Bortz, and Van Horn, the nucleus of this group. Fontenot in the middle replaced Jay Hilgenberg, who's now in Cleveland. Of course, the rookie on the left. But this is the way, from an offensive line standpoint, you like to start the game. Come off the ball hard, fast, straight ahead. Muster in motion on third and two as they give them yet another look, but this time the Vikings are right there. Jack Del Rio, the plan B pickup. Dallas left him unprotected. Dennis Green came in. He knew he needed a middle linebacker, and he went out, and he told us last night, we recruited this guy like it was college. Take a look at him. He's been around. He started in New Orleans, Kansas City, and then Dallas makes a big stop, All-American from USC, and he was just what this 4-3 needed for Tony Dungy, who believes in the 4-3. Remember those great Steeler defenses with Jack Lambert in the middle? Chris Gardaki, the left-footed kicker, sails one into the wind, and it's fair caught at the 24-yard line by Anthony Parker. As the Vikings take over for the first time in the game, 345 into the first quarter, no score. David. Rich Gannon from the University of Delaware, originally drafted by New England and then sent immediately to Minnesota in a trade. 
11 touchdowns and eight interceptions this season. Terry Allen, second year back out of Clemson, with three wideouts, Johnson, Carter, and Carter, the unrelated Carters, Anthony and Chris, and Tice is the tight end. Great offensive line. Zimmerman, McDaniel, who was banged up last week, but starting. Loudermilk, Habib, and the veteran Tim Irwin in his 12th year from Tennessee. That's Chris Carter in motion from the 24. Gannon right to the air to Anthony Carter, and he gets upended by Donnell Wolford. Good one-on-one -on -one tackle after a minimal game. Now let's take a look at the Chicago defense. For years, they've played the base 4-3. Armstrong, McMichael coming off another sensational game at the age of 35. The Fridge and Dent. And then the three linebackers, Roper, Singletary in his final season, and Morrissey having a good year. Wolford and Stintz in the corners. Gale and Carrier are the safeties. Second down, call it seven. That's Steve Jordan, who's missed a couple of games, 83, on a wing to the right. Chris Carter in motion. And Terry Allen looks for room and finds some and plows ahead as he's become their feature back up to the 34-yard line, tackled by Perry and Gale. A touchdown, this being in the natural surface, a little slower than the artificial surface, but Terry Allen, in the one time the Vikings played on a natural surface this year, was a Green Bay in the opening day of the season. He had 140 yards rushing, so we know what he can do. Much has been made about the fact that Jack Burns is the offensive coordinator of the Vikings, and who served under Joe Gibbs, and right off the bat, what do we see by the Vikings, but the old counter tray. Mm -hmm. It looks like the posse out there, too, doesn't it? <laughs> First and ten at the 34, five minutes into the game, no score. Gannon into the air. Scrambles. He can run. And he runs for a first down. That's a gain of 13, and Terry Allen through the block to send him out to the 47-yard line. Another Viking first down. Well, Gannon is a good athlete. He runs about a 4-5-40, and you saw an example of it right there. He is rushed for over 250 yards in each of the last two years and you kind of think that Mike Ditka is kind of happy this is happening this field is going to be slow to begin with and it's going to slow down considerably with this kind of rainfall Minnesota assistant coaches Jack Burns is their offensive coordinator Tony Dungy in the center of the picture is the defensive coordinator at his first and ten at the 47 yard line Jordan in motion Allen across the 50 into Chicago territory takes it to the 47 yard line Singletary makes the hit if there's one thing Allen though has been prone to this season it's fumbling he fumbled twice in the game at the Metrodome but what a lofty 4.7 yards per carry average for Terry Allen and Dennis Green Al you touched on it right at the top you talk about a man who's just come in and taken it by storm and of course almost 12 yards to carry against the Packers, the only game they played on grass all year long. And the field tonight is in excellent shape. Second and five as Allen plows ahead, and he's close to a first down. Under any circumstance, this field is going to be heavy and what you'd call slow, and particularly so in this situation with all of the rain last night, even though the field was covered. Well, as far as the Bears are concerned, I don't think it could be slow enough. I mean, the Vikings have the advantage when it comes to team speed. And the Bears, when we were here yesterday, I inquired as to whether or not the tarp was on the field, and they said yes, and I said why? And their response is, because we have to. The league makes us put the tarp on the field. One other factor we might point out as they bring the yard markers out, the Vikings are right now here in the first quarter going with about a 25-mile-per-hour win. And they continue to move the ball on the ground, but down there before the game, as you can see, they are short. We were watching the kickers, and they were really having a struggle kicking the ball from your left to the right. Well, the Bears had a drive similar to this when they opened up the game and got stopped on a third and short. Now we'll see if Mike Ditka's defense can stop this very impressive-looking Minnesota drive today. Third and a short one at the 43. 8.22 remaining. Opening quarter, no score. And they line up Randall McDaniel in the backfield as a fullback in the eye. They do this quite often. And give it to Whoa. Allen behind McDaniel, who Whoa. takes it inside the 40 to the 37-yard line. Oh, my Lord. McDaniel hits Mike Singletary. <laughs> Catches Singletary jumping over somebody. In Mike's defense, he didn't have his feet on the ground, but this, my friends, is a crushing block. Watch McDaniel. There is Singletary. Whoa. That is why 
McDaniels in the backfield. I mean, that hat is right in the middle of Mike Singletary. Again, you goes 280, by the oh. way. And maybe the best all-around athlete on the team. Now this is Allen picking up three. McDaniel's not the only big man we figured to see in the backfield tonight. Mike Ditka has stated publicly, look for Fridge Perry in the Chicago backfield before this one is over. McDaniel has to go out of the game anytime uh, a player goes to an eligible position as McDaniel does when he goes into the backfield. He must leave for one play. And there is the Fridge who has practiced all week at the running back position. Ditka has openly talked about letting him throw a pass. We may see anything from Perry tonight. We see Roger Craig now in the backfield, the longtime 49er who came over from the Raiders as a plan B, taking the toss from Gannon. And this is Roger Craig high-stepping it inside the 25 to the 20-yard line and a Viking first down on a very impressive opening drive behind the block by Steve Jordan, who's missed a couple of weeks with knee and ankle injuries. Yeah, Jordan has to do one of the hardest things anyone can be asked to do, and that is be moving parallel to the line of scrimmage and turn upfield and make a block. And that time he had to chop down Richard Dent, and he did it. And Jordan, who's nursing a bad knee, a bad ankle, puts Dent on the ground, and that allows Craig to break the containment and get to the outside. That's a 13-yard game. Thus far, the Vikings have picked up 55 yards on this drive. That's Nova Selsky in motion. And this is Craig again going nowhere. Tackles for a loss by Richard Dent. Yeah, try me once, and it works. Try me twice, and I'll show you why I'm a Pro Bowl football player. You know, he asked Denny Green how he uses Terry Allen and uh, Roger Craig, and he says almost by feel. There is no definite way we do it, no formula, and there's Dent playing off the block and making a superb tackle. Well, did you see how he got his head to the outside? That was the key. Classic. Yep, work your head to the outside. Don't lose contain. 5.35 to go. First quarter, no score. Second down. And 11 at the 21-yard line. On a draw. Craig to the 16-yard line. That's going to set up a third and five. Steve McMichael makes the tackle. Chris, clean first quarter. We played almost 10 minutes. No penalties. Bears impressive early in their drive and then stopped, had to kick, and the Vikings on a long march now. Third and five at the 16-yard line. Three wide out set. Craig offset in the backfield. Gannon throws, catch is made at the six-yard line. That is a first down. Anthony Carter to the first and goal as the Vikings convert on a key third down. Gannon right on target. Carter just gave a little move on Donnell Wolford. And Wolford has got to play Carter cautiously from this part of the field. He's playing about as tight as you can get. Carter turns right back in. Great timing between Gannon and Carter. Mark Good. Carrier was a safety to the inside who was supposed to give Wolford some help and Carrier came up and didn't wrap up, didn't put a hit on the receiver and didn't provide a lot of help to his corner. First and goal. Craig is the tailback. Roger with the football. Craig tries to burrow his way in and is stopped short. Inside the one will be second and goal. Dante Jones at the bottom of the pile. Very impressive downwind drive that started at the 23-yard line. Jack Burns calling the plays for the Minnesota Vikings. As L Burns. reported as an eligible receiver, number 64. Randall McDaniel comes in. He'll be in the backfield as an eligible receiver. I know one thing. Mike Singletary's got an eye on him. Second and goal, Craig. Behind McDaniel, Jordan in motion. That's a lot of heft on the right side, and it's exploited by Craig for a touchdown. Going in behind Jordan and McDaniel, and the guys in the interior on the right side, and the Vikings march down the field going 76 yards for the score. That time it was McDaniel putting a block on Dante Jones, number 53. More importantly, the Vikings picking up where they left off in the fourth quarter four weeks ago. They could not put a point on the board in the first three quarters of the first meeting. 
and they ultimately, of course, won that game 21-20, but they have a very impressive drive here in the first quarter. Remember, Dennis Green was in San Francisco when Bill Walsh was doing the same thing with Guy McIntyre in the backfield. So much of this offense, they look like the 49ers and the Redskins. Quad Reves to the point after. Take a look at the blocking as we go to commercial with 3.19 to go in the quarter. 7-0 Viking. He's 280 pounds. Kind of hard to do anything about it. But Daniel, a good athlete also. That's down Roger Gray. Soldier Field in Chicago. Temperature in the mid-40s. It was dry when we began. We had a brief shower that lasted about three minutes. It's dry again. And it's seven to nothing, Minnesota. After that long drive, Reves to kick off, and I guess he missed it. If he didn't, if he touched it, this is going to be a Chicago touchdown for Ron Rivera. Well, it had fallen off the tee, so he must have touched it. What are they going to say now? The whole question is, did he touch the football? Dick Hantak is the referee. He has to come all the way up the field. Oh, boy. Uh, did it come off the tee? Uh, Kenny, Kenny Wolf, own, our producer, producer is blew telling us that, that he didn't hit it. Well, <laughs> if you had replay, we'd have a conclusive answer here now. We're going to see what the officials determine. <laughs> he <laughs> back with a smile. There is no play. The ball had not been touched by the kicker. Classic. They got the call right. Well, we talked about the wind as well. Look at it. The wind wobbles the ball. It goes off the tee, and R Reves just walks by the ball. But it was a smart, I'll say this, a smart play by Rivera. Go ahead and pick it up and go. There's no instant replay to reverse anything. You might as well uh, give the crowd a thrill and, and maybe get lucky. <laughs> sure got the Soldier Field crowd into the game here in a hurry. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> laughing. Out of <laughs> the Bears have scored first in every game they've played so far this year, and they're with their four and three record <laughs> until tonight, when the Vikings take this seven to nothing lead. That would have been an NFL record for the return of a kickoff, wouldn't it? Phantom return. Joe Johnson will hold it for a base this time. Who boots a low liner, fielded at the goal line by Gentry. He goes back into the end zone, and it is a touchback. And so Chicago will take over at the 20. And now it's time for our regular feature on what's new in the world of sports science and technology. A look. Wonderful and an even rivalry through the years. The Vikings came into the league in 61. Only 23 yards separate the teams. Only one turnover separates the teams. And through the years, the Vikings hold the edge in the series 31 to 29 with two ties. Minnesota leads 7 to nothing. Chicago first and 10 to the 20 with 312 to go in the opening quarter. Harbaugh to throw. Under pressure. He escapes. And escapes with perhaps a first down in fact they'll give it to him he's out at the 31 yard line he was chased by Dolman but Dolman couldn't get him and Harbaugh picks up 11. Oh Dolman made a mistake though Dolman could have sacked Harbaugh behind the line of scrimmage but he tried to knock the football out of Jim Harbaugh's arm and he missed and Harbaugh took off he's a good running back one of the better runners you're going to find at this position now watch 56 he doesn't go for the tackle he goes for the swipe and misses Harbaugh the ball, had, and away he goes. Yeah, Harbaugh had a little more of a burst, I think, Franklin, than, than Dolman was anticipating. Good running quarterback. First and 10 at the 31-yard line. Straight ahead goes Neil Anderson. He picks up three or four, taking it to the 35-yard line. Brad Culpepper, 77, rookie out of Florida, makes the stop. A couple of things that Tony Dungy did when he came in as defensive coordinator was move a lot of people around. Excuse me, Al. And one of them being John Randall was a defensive end a year ago. He moved him into the inside, picked up Jack Del Rio. We've already talked about him. And sort of freed up Chris Dolman to play like he used to play when Keith Millard was on his inside. So Chris Dolman has a little more freedom now. And he is having a great year, eight and a half sacks into the night. At the moment, Culpepper, the rookie, and George Hinkle, 98. 
along the defensive front as the catch is made at the 45-yard line by Wendell Davis, and that's a first down for Chicago. Al Noga was the guy who leveled Harbaugh. I'll point it out again. Harbaugh throwing in to a real brisk win. We were down on the field before the game. It's tough to throw the ball very far downfield. He has a lot of velocity on this. Gets it to Wendell Davis. Davis gets the first down. But to win tonight's game, the Bears have to be successful in their passing game. Jim Harbaugh and his arm have become such a big part of Chicago's offense that they can't win a game without Harbaugh having a successful night throwing the ball, especially against a talented front seven like the Vikings. First and ten at the 46-yard line. Fake toss, inside handoff. Muster takes it across the 50 and is pushed back by Merriweather and his friends after a gain of close to five. Clock ticks down, about a minute and five remaining in the first quarter. Seven to nothing, Minnesota. Well, as a former receiver and a former player, I can tell you that bear huddle right now, the receivers and the backs are thinking, looking up at that clock. In about 50 seconds, we're going to turn it around and we're going to be going downwind, and it does make a major difference. They're able to move the ball right now into the wind. They have here in their second drive as they did the first drive, but things should be dramatically different for them when they turn and go with the wind. Second and five at the 49-yard line. Anderson goes nowhere. In fact, stops for a minimal loss at the 50-yard line. It's going to be third and five or six when the second quarter begins. Chris Dolman makes the hit, 56. Let's take a look. There's Troy Ozzie, number 70, the left tackle. And you see how he gets driven backwards and Muster trying to make the lead block actually hits Ozzie right in the back. Ozzie is playing with a very bad left shoulder. And it is a real hindrance to him, not only in his pass protection, but obviously his run blocking as well. And Stan Thomas, the number one draft choice, is going to see some action tonight at left tackle. End of a crisply played first quarter with 19 rushes and three passes. And we'll return to Monday Night Football after this message and a work more ABC station. Chicago, the Sears Tower, and the other beautiful skyscrapers. Hancock Building uh, up the lake. There it is on the right. Beautiful shot of the Windy City. Second or third down and six as the second quarter begins, but this is no play because it has been whistled dead by Dick Pantak. We had a penalty-free first quarter, nary a flag. Ball start <laughs> prior to the snap on the offense, number 70, five-yard penalty, still third down. And the second quarter begins with a penalty before uh, any time elapses. Now, 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 guys, the Vikings have been lobbying the NFL hard about false starts by teams that have been playing them. Uh, specifically, last week, their game against Washington, Tony Dungy there, you see in the middle, uh, has openly speculated that he might be fined by the league for his complaints. And it looks like some of that... Uh, a noise that they've been making has paid off because there you get one called against Ozine, the left tackle of the Bears. It looks like some of their lobbying is bearing fruit. Third down and 11, and Harbaugh throws an out pattern, which is short of the first down. Dennis Gentry makes the catch, but Chicago will have to kick as Carl Lee runs him out of bounds. Just take a look at those stats for the first quarter and a very quickly played first quarter. 77 yards for the Vikes, 54 for the Bears, a couple of long drives for both teams. But, Dan, further to what you say, the reason that is for the Vikings, they play such a slashing, attacking-type defense, as you well know. Any kind of a movement, and Noga and Dolman are gone. And they are very quick off the ball, and they have been called for a lot of penalties that they felt were just maybe a lineman flipping a finger, just a little flex of the hand, and you cannot do that on that offensive line. They've complained over and over. Fourth and two, and Gardaki to punt. And a little too far. Goes into the end zone. Chased down by Maurice Douglas. Minnesota will take over at the 20 with 14.09 to go in the half. 7 0 Minnesota. That's right. I wish I could hold the club that loose uh, with that right hand. That's we all. That grip was made out of coal. I turned it into a diamond on about the 17th hole. <laughs> Minnesota has it at the 20-yard line. Allen on a sweep, cuts inside a McDaniel block, picks up three, flag comes in. 
Dick's hand tack, the referee. And this one will come back. Unless uh, Chicago declines, it'll either be second and seven or first and 20. And Danton Perry uh, getting together with uh, Hantak and the umpire now conversion. Over just what? Maybe a double Hantak foul. Will Illegal use of the hands. Number 72 on the defense. Ooh. Hands Ooh. to the face. Five yards. First down. Well, that's why they were uh, not real happy about it. Initially, the uh, penalty indicated against Minnesota. William Perry gets the call, and let's take a look. I think Gary Zimmerman, number 65, is going to down block on Perry. There it is right there. Now watch the hands of Perry. Yeah, you can see where he's got the left hand on the face mask of Zimmerman, but I'll tell you, that's that doesn't get called very often. Automatic first. It's first and 10 at the 20. Oh, oh. Allen buried behind the line of scrimmage by Perry. And that is a rare display of emotion by William Perry, who... Pretty much just attends to his business and doesn't really be demonstrative on the field. Boy, it was and a Sean Gale, though, to clean that out. Coming up from the safety position to give Perry the free shot at it. Watch 23. He just wipes out the pulling guard, number 74, Habib. Sean Gale came back a couple of weeks ago, and he makes a difference in his defense. Well, let's see if that, that play by the fridge fires this team up a little bit. The Chicago defense needs to stiffen against Minnesota, who had a brilliant drive last time. And Gannon takes a timeout, and the crowd's into the ball game. Uh, he was running out of time on the clock. He had no choice. He had four seconds on the play clock. It's second and 11 when we come back with 13.01 to go in the first half. 7 0 Vikings. Bridge has got him fired. Presidential predictions on this election eve. They lost to the Packers in 64, LBJ won, Nixon won in 68, Vikes win in 72 and Nixon wins, Carter wins in 76, Vikings beat the Skins, Reagan wins, Vikings won again, then they won again, and what does it all tell us? <laughs> if the Vikings win, the Republicans win. Well, I'm sure Clinton and Bush are going <laughs> to not wait up all night. If they lose, the Democrats win, and I guess if this game winds up in a tie, Perot wins, huh? Anyway, it's second down and 11 at the 28-yard line for the Minnesota Vikings as Gannon fires for a first down to Chris Carter, who drags Bears with him into Chicago territory to the 46-yard line. Lemuel Stinson finally knocks him down, and the Chicago Bears trying to extricate the football, and uh, it cost them a few yards oh, on the tackle. Good pass by Gannon right in between. Sean Gale and Lemuel Stinson. 32 Stinson. Here comes Sean Gale over to help. But a well-thrown football by Gannon. And a pretty doggone good waiver acquisition uh -huh. is Chris Carter. Buddy Ryan put him on waivers in Philadelphia. And Minnesota more than gladly said thanks. But he just didn't like him, did he? Nope. Said he was only good inside the 20-yard line. Allen to the 44-yard line. Yeah, he said he ran that fade right. pattern yeah, into yeah. the end zone, and that yeah. was all he could do. Caught about 10 touchdown passes yeah. for Buddy Ryan, and Buddy Ryan released him the next year, and that, and he didn't think he had much speed. Well, he led the uh, Vikings in receiving last year, and he's leading them again this year, and all for the $100 it costs to pick up a player off of waivers. And there's some good numbers right there. Yeah. 28 catches in the last four games. There's some pretty good Viking receivers over that period of time. Second, all, all for free. Second most in Viking history. Joe Sensor with the record, 30 in four games. The catch is made and a burying tackle as Allen gets upended by another number 21, Donnell Wolford. Boy, Wolford's had a couple of good tackles tonight. <laughs> Got Anthony Carter at the beginning of the ball game, and this time comes up and really undercuts Allen, who barely gets his head upfield. He was lucky he held on to the ball. Yep. A little higher by Wolford. Regular it, speed. It is different at regular speed, isn't it? <laughs> and it feels different. Third down and four at the 40. 11 minutes to go on the half. 7-0 bike. Incomplete. Well, and there's the big third down play the Bears needed. 
scuffle. Bain and Carter. Bain pops Chris Carter as the ball comes in. And Carter and Tate exchange some pleasantries. I mean, Carter just runs a pattern that puts him about one yard beyond the sticks. Bain is all over this. Tate right there. And that's a, that's a pass that's pretty doggone tough to complete. I think it was Tate that got the hand in there and still avoided drawing the flag. Well, the Bears appear to be playing with more emotion and enthusiasm than they played with on the Vikings' first drive, and it, it just seemed that for the Bears, things picked up after the refrigerator gets in there and makes that play in the backfield. Harry Newsom, who's had 14 punts blocked in his career, tied for the NFL record, sends this one inside the five. Oh, and what a play! <laughs> are they able to save it from going in? Brent Novoselsky swept it out. What a play! John Randall downed it, and Novoselsky, a tight end with wide receiver like speed on that play getting down there to make a tremendous play it doesn't matter that the ball's across the plane oh and that ball hit Ooh, the goal line it did Whoa. they got away with it big position look at him straddling the goal line novoselsky but look at the ball it appears to have flicked the goal line on its way back out that would have been an interesting look for instant replay. But of course, there is that. <laughs> but and the game goes on. Probable reversal had there been some. First down from the two-yard line, and here comes a flag on the pass intended for Tom Waddle. Then C. Glenn with the coverage. Well, there were a couple of flags that coverage. came in there simultaneously. Pass interference, defense number 26, first down. Saying that is McMillan, but Glenn, both McMillan and Glenn arrived about the same time. Let's take a look. Number 26, he gets the arms way too early. The ball's not there. He's all over Waddle. Draws a couple of flags, and the Bears get out from the shadow of their goalpost. First down up at the 10 yard line. That was a very confident call in your quarterback, too. Brad Muster. Mike Merriweather, 57, comes in to make the tackle. ABC's Monday Night Football is being brought to you by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? And by Sprint, not just another phone company. Al Michaels, Frank Gifford, Dan Deardorff, Soldier Field, Chicago. Great NFC Central Division matchup. Vikes come in five and two. Bears come in four and three. Chicago wins. They're tied for the top spot. Minnesota wins, as we mentioned at the beginning. Vikes would be two up and, in effect, three up because they will have the tiebreaker advantage if they wind up with the same record at the end of the year by virtue of two wins over the Bears. Second and seven at the 14-yard line. Harbaugh stays in against the blitz, gets it away, incomplete. So the Vikings were blitzing and they still had double coverage on Wendell Davis. That's the best of both worlds. Pressure on the quarterback and double coverage on the intended receiver. Interesting to see how these two teams arrived where they are in their roster. The Vikings, of course, when they traded Herschel Walker, and let's take a look at this play again. Andre McMillan, single coverage, but he's getting help from the inside, as Al pointed out, so he knew he could play him to the outside. The saw his hand flick the helmet there of Wendell Davis, but that ball was uncatchable. That, that ball was a good four yards over the head of Wendell Davis. Third and seven, 43-year-old Dennis Green and Mike Dicta. At the 14-yard line, here comes Dolman, and there goes Harbaugh with Dolman and Noga each getting credit for a half sack apiece. Well, an unusual situation here for Chicago, who will almost always, in a passing situation, try to put a tight end to Dolman's side because they've locked their rookie, Ozine, into a one-on-one -on -one situation with Dolman. And that is really a mismatch for the Bears. And if you can see the other side, maybe we can get a look at that. Noga made a great move, spinning to the inside of Keith Van Horn. Harbaugh had no chance on that. Dardaki kicking out of his end zone. This is Parker. 
letting it drop for some reason. And it's down at the 42-yard line. Another look at the Noga spin move. And the the is Van Horn. They are very quick. And they arrive right on schedule. On the lakefront, Chicago. Mm. Always a gorgeous sight. A beautiful city. Clean city. Spectacular. The Chicago Bears trail Minnesota. 7 to nothing. 9-14 to go first half. Vikings first and 10 from the 42-yard line, and Roger Craig gets wrapped up initially by William Perry for no gain. Well, Fritz is doing his part. I mean, trying to provide a spark. The Chicago offense has, has been sputtering here. No points yet on the board, but William Perry, who always played the run, makes a quick move to the onside gap and just blows by Loudermilk the center. And this man has, has done himself a big favor. Not a very good scheme when you have an onside block by your center on the, the Fritz. He's just too quick. But he's done himself a favor. Lost a lot of weight. He'll play longer, and he's a, a more service to his team. On second and ten on a pass that may have been deflected, Chris Carter can't hold on. I wonder if Morris, did, did Morrissey get a hand on it? I, I think he might have. The, the pass fluttered. It looks, yeah, it looks like Jim Morrissey just grazed the ball enough to, to change the course of it enough to disrupt Chris Carter's concentration on the ball. There's Jim Morrissey, who's leading the Bears in tackles, having a brilliant year, the best year of his eight-year career. Third and nine at the 43-yard line, 8.34 to go. First half, 7 nothing Viking. Pressure from the backside from Dent. Look out. Ooh. Ooh, and a wrap around the next sack by Dick. And here we go. Tim Irwin wants to get dead off his quarterback. Last week it was Bruce Smith and Browning Nagel. Now it's Richard Dent, Rich Gannon, and Tim Irwin. I saw it coming. Richard Dent with great speed. And it was the old lookout block, you might say, Dan. <laughs> he is very swift. When you watch Richard Dent walk, I mean, he walks slower than anybody I've ever seen. But he can still motor scooter when he's got a quarterback in sight. And Richard Dent, who I think a lot of people thought maybe his best years were behind him this year in his 10th year, turning in one of his best. Newsom's kick is a short one, and fair caught at the 28-yard line by Tom Waddle. Well, the Bears' defense is doing their part ever since that opening drive. Now they need a little help from their offense. Eight minutes, six seconds remaining. First half at Soldier Field, Minnesota 7, Chicago nothing. Well, the Fridge provided a spark to the Chicago defense. Somebody out there now in a Bear uniform needs to do the same for their offensive team. First and 10 at the 29-yard line. Darren Lewis is the new running back. Anderson gets a rest, and they give it to Lewis immediately, and he can make things happen, and he just made a fumble happen, and Minnesota, let's see, has the football. Chris Dolman is at the bottom of the pile. Well, Ditka said, I've got to get Darren Lewis into the game more. He makes things happen positively and negatively he did and somebody just reached in there and hammered it right out of Darren Lewis's hands actually his own man number 85 Keith Jennings had an elbow that hammered right into the football all right let's take a look at this thing and we'll show you right where it happened right where it happens okay take a look right here is Jennings watch him swing back his elbow right there and hits the football and knocks it right out of Darren Lewis's grip. Lewis saw no Viking near him, and so I guess momentarily relaxes on the ball. Boy, that's a bad break for the Bears. And Allen straight ahead, burrowing down to the 27-yard line, a gain of five. It'll be second and five. Roper with the hit. Here's when another look. When you see somebody coming at you to make the tackle, your grip on the football really tightens up. But Lewis right here sees that he's going through, sees nothing from the left side, has the ball out away from his body 
and Jennings inadvertently even there doesn't realize what happened. He's carrying it too loose in that kind of traffic though Dan. He's got it yep. in the palm of his hand and he shouldn't have lost it. Yep. He had it out away from his body and Dolman trailing the play makes the recovery second and five from the 27 yard line Allen the second year back out of Clemson who tore up his knee in college and thus he was a low pick he was a ninth round choice then injured his knee again in 1990 last year started on the bench and by the time the season was over he was the key guy and he is the main guy now for Dennis Green in this attack as he precipitated the release of Herschel Walker and the Vikings by the way have not had a number one draft pick for three years because of Herschel Walker a number two draft pick or number three and they have really done a great job turning this team around with plan B they have nine of those seven trades they've made They've done a wonderful job collecting players. Third and one, and they give it to Allen, and he has the first down. He takes the ball to the 19-yard line. Singletary makes the tackle with 6.30 to go in the half, and Minnesota driving and leading 7 to nothing. Monday night football visits the brand-new Georgia Dome for the first time ever. Next Monday, the San Francisco 49ers upset yesterday by Phoenix. Steve Young figures to be healthy again. The emerging back in Ricky Waters, the incomparable Jerry Rice against the Falcons on Monday Night Football a week from tonight. First and ten. Vikings at the 18-yard line. Jordan in motion. Gannon, the pump fake. Gannon going for six, but throws it out of the end zone. Intended for Anthony Carter. Covered by Mark Carrier. I think Gannon thought he was going to get man-for-man -man coverage. He pumped fake for Carter. And Carter broke to the outside. The carrier was covering deep. Donnell Wolford up short in the zone. And carrier had the coverage deep. And Gannon had to just basically throw it away. Well, it's a one receiver pattern. And if and if the guy doesn't bite, and Carrier did, it's a dead play. And and that was a veteran play by Gannon. You're exactly right, Frank. Just dumping the ball, throwing it away. Dennis Green told us something important about Gannon. He needs to learn that not every play works. And that was a good example. Second and ten. And there goes Allen squirting inside the 10, taking it to the 8. That should be enough for a first down. Sean Gale makes the tackle. First and goal. And Allen showing why he is one of the big reasons they could let Herschel Walker go. That and the fact that Walker just was not going to fit into the offense of Denny Green and Jack Burns, the offensive coordinator. But they have done a great job at the picking up the nine plan B players. And, Ten free agents and seven players by trade. In contrast to Chicago, they have two plan B players, none that they have acquired through trade, and only six that are free agents. Chicago better hope they never get rid of the draft. They've done it all with the draft. First and goal. Allen again, and he takes it to the three-yard line. It'll be second and goal with five minutes to go in the first half. Well, you know, so much has been made about Dennis Green and this job that he's done with Minnesota at times I think people have gotten carried away and making it sound like he inherited a, a horrible football team I mean the Vikings were not a, a talent wise were always an excellent team I think uh, across the spectrum of, of quality players they were underachievers they didn't perform up to their capabilities and Dennis Green just has them now performing up to the capabilities to the type of player that they have and they had some problem players too and, they and they're going that up Second and goal. Chris Carter in motion. Allen. Allen can get to the one-yard line. It'll be third and goal. Part of that quality you were talking about, too, Dan, is in that offensive line. Yeah, they are. Well, you can see it tonight, can't you? Loudermilk at center. Randall McDaniel, we've already talked about playing hurt tonight. Gary Zimmerman, the big left tackle. There's Habib, 74, the guard. Right now, Shriver has come into the game, and McDaniel figures to line up in the backfield, which he does. Third down and goal. Allen is the tailback. Jordan with the leverage on the left side. They go in that direction, and Allen does not get in. All right, you Dennis Green here. It's fourth down. Goal. Three and a half to go in the half. Do you take the easy three, or do you try to make it 14 to nothing? Well, you can't fault him either way, regardless of the decision he makes. But the way his offensive line has been 
moving the Bears off the ball. They sure have to be tempted to go for it, and that's what they're going to do. Yep. I mean, this is this is a decision based upon what he's seen here in the second quarter. And, and he has seen his offensive line winning the battle up front. And there goes Allen, knifing in for the touchdown. Now, a little bit of a stalemate at the line of scrimmage, but Allen, taking off from about the three-yard line, launched himself over the goal line. Well, Mike Singletary was the leaper for the Bears, and he just missed. I mean, that's some of that is just guesswork by the middle linebacker. You have to pick that imaginary point and hope you meet the running back there. Watch to the right. Here comes Singletary, and he just goes right by Allen. And you can't wait to check it out where he's coming. You have to know from having looked at the tapes of what they like to do on their goal line offense and Singletary just missed by a fraction. Reveys for the point after with 3-10 to go in the first half. When the leaper misses the leapy, it's a touchdown. And if you don't hit him straight on, somebody like Allen's going to yeah. get it. You've got to just take him pretty much straight on. The Singletary again. A lot of traffic in front of him. He goes up and chips the pass of the night. And Dante Jones, who was trailing on the play, makes a good square hit on Allen, but he was there too late. And there's Vince Tobin on the right, the Bears defensive coordinator, and talking to his certain Hall of Fame middle linebacker, Mike Singletary, who's playing his last year in the National Football League. And it's, uh, it's just one of those guys who just, uh, in that Lawrence Taylor mode where you just wonder, will the game be as much fun to watch without without them on the field? Lawrence Taylor may have to rethink his retirement after last night. He had a strong performance as the Giants. Uh, it was a bad day for New the York whammy, yesterday, wasn't it? Put the whammy on, on the Redskins. Jets, Jets whacked Miami, and, and Giants may play a superb game against the Washington Redskins. Lawrence Taylor, Hostetler was outstanding. 3-10 to go in the first half. Meanwhile, the uh, Bears in that game in Minnesota had that 20 to nothing lead. Then the Vikings scored 21 straight points and 14 more tonight, meaning the Vikings have outscored the Bears 35 to nothing over the last three quarters. Speaking of what's happening around the league, nobody's going to want to play Phoenix now. The giant killers. I mean, they get the skins, they get the 49ers. I mean, this is... You know, they were losing some close ones prior to these... <laughs> <laughs> Kenny Wolf, Dickley, Wolf, that's last that's all they get. Yeah, they've been playing well. Joe Johnson will hold it for Quad Reves. Gentry and Lewis back to receive. It was Lewis's fumble that set the Vikings up for that short drive. At the three yard line, the veteran Dennis Gentry brings it back out to the 20 yard line. Scott and others in on the tackle. And here comes Harbaugh to lead the Bears from their own territory. And let's take a look at how he has done thus far. The drives resulting in punt, 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 and a fumble. When they started off so promisingly, the Bears crank out a couple of first downs. The first time they have the football, have a third and two, don't convert, and they have done absolutely nothing since. I think uh, the Minnesota defense is playing surprisingly well. I, I don't know why I'm saying surprisingly. Well, they are first against the pass coming into tonight, eighth against the run, fourth best in the league. So that they've been doing it with quickness on the artificial surface. Waddle in motion from the 20 yard line. Look out. Harbaugh <laughs> throws, and that one is incomplete up at the 31 yard line. Harbaugh goes down and Davis couldn't make the catch. Uh, Jim Harbaugh has been knocked down virtually every time that he has attempted to pass. That time and, Noga knocked him down. And, and, and really the Vikings just picking up where they left off last week. They abused Mark Rippon of the Redskins knocked him senseless. And this is a front four that is quickly establishing a reputation as being utterly brutal on quarterbacks reverse angle of Noga number 99 we saw him with a great spin move a moment ago and this time you just saw the sheer speed no on one side and Chris Doman on the other they are so quick second and 10 257 left in the half 14 nothing Minnesota play fake still the pressure is on a little dump off to Lewis and Lewis 
Out of bounds at the 32-yard line, and that's a first down. Jack Del Rio with the tackle. But you notice how long Harbaugh stayed in the pocket. He got back there and left. There wasn't much surveying of the field. He dropped into the pocket position and stayed there maybe a half a beat, and he was off and moving. And he was starting to get company even at a half a beat yeah. in that pocket. Made a good move to get the ball to Lewis. That right time, there, he knows he's got to get out of there. Yeah, that was a good that was a good job of blocking that time by Keith Van Horn, the right tackle, who effectively screened off Al Noga. Look how tight these guys wear their jerseys these days. That's keep from being held. First and ten of the 32, and Harbaugh has to take a timeout with 2:24 left in the half. And you know, it's a funny thing with Harbaugh because he was the recipient of that very public tongue lashing by Ditka. Yet Harbaugh is a man who's been able to maintain his equanimity. And keep in mind, he followed up that game with two of the best games of his career, a 300-yard day against Tampa Bay, and then last week against Green Bay, at one point he completed 13 consecutive passes to tie a bear record. He is tough, he is confident, and in a way, he's arrogant. And I think I'm... good. And I think I speak for our audience that, that we're so pleased that he's maintained his equanimity because uh, we all knew that was a real concern of, uh, of the audience coming into tonight's game was Jim... Uh, well, you, you know, what did Tony Dungy say when he was a scout for the Steelers? He went up to watch a young quarterback or actually the scouting defensive back for Michigan and he saw Harbaugh come off the field he's playing quarterback for Bo Schembechler and he said Bo Schembechler met him coming off the field and chewed on him for the entire 30 seconds between the two plays and he said look yeah, Harbaugh is taking it from the best I know he's what that feels like Bo Schembechler and he's handled it very well first and ten of the 32 yard line with Waddle going in motion Lewis makes the catch. And Lewis, who's been known to break a lot of tackles, broke the initial one and then finally gets uh, knocked down by Lee and Parker. Aaron Lewis is a fine runner. He set the Southwest Conference rushing record, and that's pretty tough to do when you think back to some of the great running backs that have played down there. Broke four tackles last week against Green Bay and a 30-yard touchdown run. We have come to the two-minute warning. Two touchdown advantage for the Vikings. That little illumination decoration has become commonplace for every Bears night game. Go Bears, they say. Recently, it could be Go Ditka. <laughs> They've no. really been on his case. Well, we'll get into that in halftime and detail it throughout the game. Of course, Mike has been, as he always is, the A lightning piece, the focal point but especially so of late. Second and seven at the 35-yard line. Harbaugh going up to the 44-yard line, and that's complete for a first down. Wendell Davis makes the catch. Chicago with two timeouts left. I tell you, this is where Harbaugh is at his best, when he's calling his own plays on the field, two-minute drill, no huddle. He can move a football team. And an inside give from the shotgun, oh. and Anderson gets buried by Del Rio, who smelled that one out and decks him at the line of scrimmage. Well, so somebody else called that. Talk about the resurrection of a career. Jack Del Rio mm. fits that to a T. I mean, here is a guy that untapped potential, never was the player that most people thought he was going to be coming out of USC, and he has just undergone a transformation in Minneapolis. I mean, this guy not is just doing a decent job but I mean he is the the glue that's holding that defense together I mean look at this background starts with the Saints then to Kansas City and really none of those towns was he really a, a guy that that they thought was an indispensable type player but he is here it's Dallas put him on plan B a lot of people thought he wouldn't leave because he just bought a new home down there and and he was courted by the Minnesota Vikings as we told you about earlier and well, it's classic textbook play by the middle linebacker. Well, he just reads it all the way. He's so just well locked on do. Anderson and, and it isn't going to leave the middle. We were talking about earlier about the makeup of this Viking team. 22 new players. That's remarkable. And to be on top of your division. Second and nine now at the 45. 135 to go on the half. 14 to nothing Minnesota. Oh, Harbaugh throwing. 
incomplete to the 40 of the Vikings and tackled is Wendell Davis at the 38-yard line. Merriweather put the pressure on Harbaugh, but he stood in there and uh, got it to the receiver. I'll tell you, you spelled Harbaugh, T-O-U-G-H. He knew he was going to get creamed. Delivered the ball, jumped to his feet so he could get back up and save time. Bears conserving their timeouts. They have two of them. Neil Anderson takes oh, yeah. the flip, flips the tackle inside the 30. Another tackle is broken, takes it to the 18. First down. Harbaugh again, trying to get the Bears up to the line of scrimmage so he can kill the clock. Saving those timeouts, he's got two of them, and now he throws the ball into the ground to make it second and 10 with 51 seconds remaining. Tremendous run by Neil Anderson. Neil Anderson has not had a 100-yard day in going back to the playoffs after the 90 season, but he still shows what he can do. Turned into a great receiver. And let's take a look at Harbaugh. We talked about it a moment ago. He knew he was going to get hit by Merriweather, took the shot, leaped to his feet, and got back up to get another play. Now, here's Anderson again. Good receiver. Look at the move. Covering up the football and getting the first down. On second down and 10 now. Harbaugh throwing. It's caught at the 11-yard line. That's Waddle making the catch. The Bears will take a timeout. They have one remaining, and upcoming is a very critical third down and three. 41 seconds on the clock. Take a look at Waddle. He is the man, the go-to man for the Bears when they get down inside the 20-yard line. He just has a knack of getting open. That time he looked to the inside, broke it, back off to the outside, and Harbaugh was right in sync with him. That was a nicely designed play by Greg Landry in the offense, flooding that side of the field and, and having Harbaugh squat down as the short man. I'll tell you one thing. If they don't make it on this... Interesting here. call. It was huh? an interesting call on grounding. But you have two timeouts left and 40 some odd ticks. And when Harbaugh threw it into the ground, you cost yourself it down. If they don't convert here, uh, you got to go back and look at that call. Oh, and then you also have the decision if they don't convert here, uh, do you go for the first down and, and trying to get a touchdown or do you mm -hmm. take the field goal? Yep. I don't know. Not, it's all moot if they make it, but right. if they don't, you got to look at that. You, it, it's, you can see it with one timeout. Well, you could but also be two. thinking draw right here, too. Third down There's and three a, at the 11-yard line. Known to do it. Gentry in motion. Fake draw. Harbaugh reverse roll incomplete. Intended for Wendell Davis. Good coverage by Anthony Parker. Fourth down, and now they're compelled on fourth and three yeah. to settle for three. Yeah, that was a, that was a mistake in grounding the football. Yep. Yeah, with, with one timeout or no timeouts, you can see it, but not with two. Again, the little fake draw to Anderson. A good coverage provided by Parker. Anthony Parker right with Wendell Davis all the way. It would have had to have been a perfect throw. It wasn't. 28-yard attempt. Harbaugh to hold for Kevin Butler. And he boots it through. So, in effect, they had one less down. They still got one timeout left up on the wall where it will probably stay. And it's 14 to 3 with 33 seconds left in the half. Well, thanks to Jim Harbaugh's toughness and to a sparkling run after a short catch by Neil Anderson, at least the Bears can go into the locker room with, with, with some points on the board, even though they trail by 11. This, this guy here has played a pretty doggone first half. We haven't seen anything near a situation where the Bears can put Perry into the backfield and make use of his backfield talents the way that the Vikings have made use of Randall McDaniels. Coming up at halftime, a reminder that we've got a nice interview Al did last evening with Dennis Green, the new coach of the Vikings, and we'll then in turn discuss Mike Ditka and what has been a tumultuous fall here in Chicago. <laughs> in a tumultuous career, but this fall yeah. has, has exceeded that. <laughs> that. That fall could be a double entendre, yeah. too. <laughs> someone well, asked I, him, I meant awesome. Yes. <laughs> someone, asked him, someone asked him what he would be if he left football. He said, well, I might be a writer. He said, I could be as absurd as some of the things that I've read. <laughs> <And> <laughs> he does stroke him the wrong way at times. 
Well, I don't think that Mike is all that concerned with no. what the media thinks about him. Nobody has coached. The, it's an amazing thing. George Hallis coached this team for 40 years, but in four 10-year increments. So Mike holds a record for most consecutive years coaching this storied franchise. Well, now we know why George Hallis took the breaks. Yes. <laughs> Tough around here. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> well, it's not like Hallis was going to get fired. <laughs> yeah. Hard to fire the owners like Connie Mack. Butler's kick down in the end zone. Touchback. Mike Savitt at the 20. 33 seconds remaining. Soldier Field kind of quiet at the moment. Their team down by 11. We have seen a very solid half of football played by the Minnesota Vikings. Offensively, a couple of very just well executed drives strong performances by the line the back the quarterback and defensively all around this has been a good effort by the bikes and Minnesota will be content to go to the locker room with that 11 point advantage as we have come to the end of the first half Would have been an entirely different feel of this game had the Bears been able to get that into the end zone but they do have the three up there and we've already told you how close historically these games have been. Halftime. Minnesota 14, Chicago 3. We'll return with halftime activities after this message from the NFL. And a word from our ABC station. in Chicago the Vikings over the Bears 14 to 3 in a key NFC Central Division matchup. And in watching the Bears, Mike Ditka and Dennis Green of the Minnesota Vikings walk the sidelines, there's no question these two are so different in just about every way, except they are both totally committed to winning. But Al, in getting to know Dennis Green, you get the feeling that there is a, he was a young man who has been a success at the college level, the professional level already as a head coach at Stanford, a head coach at Northwestern. And you get the feeling he's going to be a great head coach in the National Football League. You do. And, and keep in mind, too, uh, Frank, it was so tough for so many years for any black coach exactly. to become a head coach. There was Art Shell and there was nobody else. And but Dennis he doesn't Green, want to hear that either. Well, exactly. He? He'd been rumored, but Dennis had been rumored uh, for several jobs, and they all fell by the wayside. I asked him last night if he ever began to lose hope. If he ever ran out of hope, he'd become an NFL head coach. Well, when you get close a couple of times, you know, a couple of times when you, when you get real close and you don't understand uh, the decision-making process and, and what went down on it, I think that can be a little frustrating. But what I try to do really is always be the one guy who's really positive, to concentrate on the job that I have right now. I've had some great jobs. And as long as you're doing a good job where you're at right then, then you don't really have to worry about that next job. At the same sense, if it's something that you can't reach, what I used to call ghost chasing, uh, I wasn't really that much interested in chasing ghosts, which means that something that you think is there really isn't. Is there one thing when you look back upon the interview process that you may have said or stated to Hedrick that made the difference to give you the job? My approach had come from the San Francisco 49ers, tried and true, four Super Bowl championships in the last 10 years, a lot of outstanding players, but none of those players being more important than the team and, uh, and working in the concept of the team. And so I think maybe that was it. I think that if they had gone with somebody who had been here, then some things would have changed and some things would not have. Uh, coming in with somebody who has no shackles at all, no tie-ins with the previous organization at all. Uh, everything would be kind of fresh and new. Uh, there are going to be some tie-overs, but the big thing was, I think, change. Of all the people you've worked with and for uh, during your coaching career, is there one man who's had the most influence on you? Well, I think as a coach, it would be Bill Walsh. I met Bill in 1977. I worked with him on and off for a lot of different years. You know, I always feel that if a guy hires you back after you leave and take another job, then you must be doing something okay. You're down the road from where you coached several years ago at Northwestern. As you think back upon that experience, and it's a very different experience in college football, what's, uh, what comes to mind about Northwestern? If I was not man enough to handle an 0-11 football season, I would have never survived in coaching. And, and it survived that 0-11 season my first year. You have to take your ego out of it. If you leave your ego in it, you're going to hate the game of football. You're going to hate everything about the teams who have worked so hard to be successful. You'll never understand the whole idea of commitment and expectations. Once you take the ego out of it, then whatever's there is there. You know, if you got a successful season, as long as you know you gave 100%, then you'll accept it. 
if you don't have a successful se a season, as long as you gave 100%, you'll appreciate that too. You won't like it, but at least you'll have a perspective about it. Is there anything in life to you that would be as satisfying as coaching football? I think any time I work with young people, I'm really happy with it. I've always enjoyed uh, working as a coaching with young adults, uh, teaching young adults, spending time with them, and uh, it's exciting. Uh, I think the thing about football that gets in your blood is there's nothing like coming out of that tunnel and going on the field meeting the ultimate challenge and taking care of business. Three years ago, when we introduced the Lexus LS400, it was hailed as nearly perfect. Our engineers took that as a challenge. Presenting the 1993 LS400, the pursuit continues. This Saturday, three undefeated powers put their national title hopes on the line. Number one, Washington tackles Pac-10 power, Arizona. Number three, Alabama meets SEC rival LSU. And fifth ranked Texas A&M hosts Louisville. All Wisconsin at Michigan State and San Diego State at Wyoming. It's regional action Saturday on ABC Sports. Vikings over the Bears, 14 to 3 at halftime. We had a good look and interesting look at Dennis Green, who's on a fast track to success, I think, in the National Football League. Uh, conversely, uh, Mike Ditka, he has known success already, 84, 85 Super Bowl champion, but it was four weeks ago the Minnesota Vikings and the Bears played, and the Bears went into the fourth quarter leading 20 to nothing. Jim Harbaugh called an automatic. He supposedly was not supposed to have called that automatic, fired it out into the flat. Todd Scott picked it off. The Bears got seven out of it, and they wound up winning that game in the fourth quarter, 21 to 20. And of course, right after this happened, Mike Ditka went into a tirade on the sideline, yelling and screaming at anyone who would listen, and particularly at his quarterback, Jim Harbaugh. That in itself set off the interesting happening here in Chicago. There were polls taken whether Ditka should stay. Every talk show was babbling on and on about it. And uh, uh, we talked earlier about this happening with Bo Schembechler and, of course, Jim Harbaugh there. And, uh, Dan, what do you feel about it? I mean, uh, is it is it gone too far? No, well, I it's an emotional game played by emotional people, and and I think that so much has been made, too much has been made about Ditka's reaction on the sideline. I I think that that he's been made out to be some type of an ogre because he yelled at Jim Harbaugh. First of all, Jim Harbaugh is an arrogant, cocky kid. He's all the things you like in a quarterback, and he's a big boy, and he can take it. He was not at all flustered by what happened. If anything, he's responded and played extremely well the, you know, in the last couple of games. The other side of it, Ditka's bitter that everybody has focused on that one play and tried to judge him all season. I've talked to the Bear coaches, and they said this is the best Mike's ever been. A pleasure to work with. A postscript to this whole thing. I talked to Mike McCaskey before the game. He's the president of the team. I said very directly, do you want Ditka to come back and be your coach next year? He's in the second year of a three-year contract. His answer was, I want Mike to be enthusiastic enough to want to come back and coach this team next year. We want him, and we certainly want him to be enthusiastic. But people very close to Mike are a little troubled with uh, Mike's mercurial behavior of late. And, of course, a lot is going to have to do with the success of this Bears team this year, and much of that success is going to take place right here this evening. And right now they are down 14 to three to the Minnesota Vikings. We'll be back with the second half in a moment. The field in Chicago, the Minnesota Vikings trying to extend their lead in the NFC Central Division to two games. And again, we'll mention if you joined us late, if they win tonight, they are in effect three games in front because if these two teams wound up tied, with a division title. If the Vikings win tonight, they'd own the tiebreaker by virtue of two wins. Chicago, meanwhile, with a victory, would be tied with Minnesota. And when you analyze the NFC guys, you have to assume that only one playoff team is going to come out of the NFC Central. Probably three out of the NFC East. Season halfway over after tonight as Butler's kick is taken at the goal line by Darren Nelson. And the one-time feature back for the Vikings, the former Stanford star, now in the waning stages of his career and a special teams player, is tackled by Maurice Douglas. Here comes Gannon and the Vikes, and we'll take a look at the numbers through the first 30 minutes of action. First quarter was even, but the second quarter, uh, Minnesota. And of course, the one dominant bear fumble in their own territory by Lewis converted into a touchdown by the Vikings. Mm -hmm. A long drive, time of possession heavily favored 
for the Vikings. From the 19-yard line, Curry Allen. Moving the pile, takes it out to the 24-yard line. The football is loose. Chicago has it. And this is what the Bears needed. Well, Chicago made a mistake at their end of the field and paid for it. And now if the Bears are to get back in this game, they need to make the Vikings pay. Sean Gale is the man who recovered it. It may have been pulled out by Dent. I'll tell you, he has been a great addition. He missed the first five games, came back in the last couple of games. He has had terrific games. Dent, I think, pulled the ball loose. Sean Gale covered it, and the Bears are at the 22-yard line. Moving that pile, and Dent got the arm in. Gale with the recovery. The ball is at the 21. Waddle in motion. And Waddle's pass is picked off by Jack Del Rio. And Del Rio, with a convoy, gets past Harbaugh. Waddle tries to chase him down and can't. And Jack Del Rio, if he doesn't run out of gas, with a flag down back at the 32, for the moment is in the end zone, but there's a marker down at the 32-yard line. Didn't you think that ball hit the ground? I thought the <laughs> it's a moot point because they ruled an interception, but it looked like the ball hit the turf. Well, first of all, Jim Harbaugh tried to force that ball in there. It sure looks like it's coming back. Waddle was covered completely. We have a low block on number 57 on Chicago. An unnecessary roughness. We have a touchdown. Whoa. We will assess the 15-yard penalty on the kickoff. That's the weirdest touchdown I've ever seen. Everybody on the field thought it was coming back. A low block by Chicago. And maybe an incomplete pass to begin with. Well, how can a block, a, a, a block that is a penalty... Well, I think he... I think oh, he's calling the block on Thayer on Chicago during the play. And then the interception. The and penalty, the yeah. Take he's, a look calling, at he's calling the penalty right there on the right side of your screen. First things first. Isn't it an interception? Whoa. Well, first of all, yeah. Waddle got tied up with the official. Did that ball one hop to uh, Del Rio? It sure, sure looked, looked like, like it, to, it me. Did to me, among other things. Here's the Reveille's extra point. So after Chicago gets the big break on the fumble, they turn around. Del Rio with the interception. Take another look now. See if we can detect it. Mm. Well, actually, now when we look at it from that angle, it looked like Del Rio had his hands under the ball, scooped it up, and then fell on top of it. That's, that is not one of those looks that, if we had instant replay, that you could say decisively they would have turned that over. I, I see Waddle gets tied up with the umpire, number 50. He never was in the play. He got knocked off. That might have been a completion if he hadn't got knocked off by the official. Well, the official is just part of the field. Exactly. Del Rio, you're right. right. Here, now you'll see it. Watch, look at Waddle. Yep. He Bumps just, into yeah. the umpire, Garib. Okay. Just, and that ball would have been complete had he not had that collision with the official. What a that's, bizarre play. That's a heck of a play by Jack Del Rio, keeping the ball from hitting the field. Yep. And what looked like a very, very fortunate set of circumstances for the Chicago Bears has turned into disaster. They had a chance to, if they got in the end zone, to make it a 14 to 10 ball game, and now they trail 21 to 3. And what a wacky way for that play to end because the Vikings go into the end zone. There's a mini celebration. Then they think it's coming back because most of the runbacks of that nature do come sure. back for illegal blocks. And then they're all the way back upfield before Hantak says, you guys can celebrate again. Well, when he first, when he made the call, a block against number 57, I'm just naturally assuming that it's against Merriweather, the linebacker of the Vikings. Instead, he calls yep. it on Thayer of the Bears. And now the Vikings kick off from the 50-yard line. More importantly, the Bears are down 21 to 3 to the Vikings, who are the fourth best in the league defensively. And the Bears' offense is not exactly Come back. a catch-up offense. Not tonight. Well, they haven't exhibited any of those tendencies tonight, even though they're fifth in the league 
offensively coming into the game but they're going to have to pull off well it's the type of comeback that Minnesota pulled off in the Metrodome. Fourteen nineteen to go in the third quarter. Twenty one to three and now it has begun to uh, drizzle again. And you have a lot of people that that left their seats at halftime to go out and get some refreshments or something to eat that are making their way back towards their seats right now. All the portals are jammed here in the stadium and they are trying to figure out how come the scoreboard says twenty one to three. <laughs> Thomas nearly jumped offside. Harbaugh on first down gets sacked back at the 13-yard line. Randall, the first guy to hit him, and then Dolman finishes him off. And then Randall with a little bit of a dance. A duck walk. That's a big bit of a dance. Of the choreographed celebrations that we've seen by various plays, players around the league. That's not challenging Ernest Gibbons or any one of that magnitude. Well, this defensive line came into the game with 21 sacks. That's, that's a lot of sacks halfway through the season. Dolman was the leader, but all of them had at least four sacks along the defensive line alone. And they've improved tonight. Second and 16. Draw play. Tell you, what it, tell you what it points out, Frank. They have 24 sacks altogether, which is a, a good solid number. I consider the Bears coming in with a good pass rush only had 19. But when you're getting 20 of your 24 sacks out of your front four, you can play a much more conservative game with your back seven. You don't have to gamble with the blitz. You don't have to throw your secondary into one-on-one -on -one coverage where you get burned for the big play. When you get that kind of a pass rush out of your front four, it is easy to play good, solid defense up and down the football field. And those are just sacks. We've seen a lot of pressure oh. tonight. Third down and five. Not like Harbaugh's seen. And that's almost intercepted by Anthony Parker that was in front of the intended receiver. Harbaugh that, gets decked again and it's fourth down. And that was almost go home. Nearly a 28 to 3 ball game. That is an uncontested stroll into the end zone. But if again, he handles you see that the ball. pressure that time it was Randall once again. Harbaugh I don't think has thrown the ball only a couple times tonight that he has not been pounded to the turf. Gardaki's kick. Bouncing at the 34 yard line. And rolling dead at the 27 yard line. That's where the Vikings get it with 12.53 remaining in the third and Minnesota leading by 18. That's a uh, that what, that's what remains of uh, the clock, the play clock, which has either blown over, gone away, or been stolen. I think it's uh, <laughs> lying on its back. Very difficult now for uh, the quarterback going in that direction to determine mm -hmm. how much time he has left. Not quite sure how they'll work this out. Please turn the play clock at the south end of the stadium off please that's uh -huh. how they're going to deal uh -huh. with it. the 25 45 second play clock at the north end of the stadium has been blown out of its moorings <laughs> we will please turn off the play clock at the south end of the stadium that that is quite a uh, quite an announcement who needs announcers don't well, answer that it's really the same uh, the same rule that if one set of uh, coaches uh, loses their headset mm -hmm. communication up to the press box. They uh, they unhook the other coaching staff. So I wonder how liberal they'll be in uh, you know, calling this. So maybe to they... me, the whole thing made more sense to just prop it back up, which there is what go. they're yeah. doing now. Yep. I, I love Hantax's yeah. description of blown meanwhile, off its moorings. Meanwhile, they have the other one turned off. Now you'll have to make an <laughs> announcement to leave the other one on because we have this one back. So while they work on that, we have 12.53 remaining. This is we like presently we're... have play clocks at both ends of the stadium. All right. This is, right, this is like replacing the uh, glass at a hockey game. Everything in good working order. And the Vikings have the ball at the 28-yard line, first and 10. 21 to 3, Minnesota. Allen 
picks up one, gets to the 29, Singletary in his final season, making the hit. So his great career coming to an end, and Mike not necessarily indicating uh, precisely what he plans to do, though he has indicated that he's not thinking about getting into coaching, at least immediately. I think a, a lot of Bear fans over the years just assumed that, I guess they have a tough time envisioning Mike Singletary doing anything that doesn't involve uh, an association with the Chicago Bears. And it was other people who talked about him coaching. On second and eight, off the play fake. Gannon chased by Perry. That's a mismatch. Up past the 30, the 35, and then fumbles out of bounds. Ron Cox is the guy who dislodges the football. But not until Gannon had escaped from Perry and is close to a first down. But he fumbled before reaching the marker, and that's where they'll spot it, that much shy of the first two and a half yards. Well, as we watch Gannon develop now in his third year as a starter, you there's just nothing frantic about him like it used to be. He used to just take off the wrong time. He, Dan pointed out earlier, you try to force a play. He's very cool out there, and he's rapidly developing into one of the better quarterbacks in the league. A good athlete. You saw that a moment ago with good speed, and he makes good decisions now. Third and a short three at the... 35-yard line. Short drop, and there's Perry with the sack at the 25-yard line. Oh, and he's yelling at Chris Carter, who broke the play on him. Carter should have yeah. been in the flat. You saw him turn around and look for Chris Carter. Chris Carter wasn't there. Chris Carter was behind him. Chris Carter was thoroughly confused. He came in motion, went behind Gannon, and then just yeah became flustered and didn't go anywhere. Uh, I think Gannon discussed his ancestry a little bit, too. And there's Carter. Now, now, look. Gannon had looked for him where he should have been out in the flat. He was his checkoff man. Well, the Vikings run a whole series of plays off, off reverses and fake reverses, and that just may have been one of them. Newsom with the kick. In the wind at the 31, Donnell Wolford, and he goes next to nowhere. The special teams maven Brent Novoselsky, who made the great play before saving the punch and going into the end zone, makes that tackle. 45-yard kick. Up aboard the bus down Michigan Avenue for another tour. It's the fabled water tower in Chicago on a cool, very crisp mid-autumn evening, and it's and very cool for the Chicago Bears. They're down by 18 at the 32-yard line. First and 10. Harbaugh picks up a hard yard before he's bumped out by Carl Lee. That, uh, that did not look like a designed play. No. Or if it was, it was not very well designed. <laughs> If it was designed, well, it wasn't designed by Harbaugh no. <laughs> to be uh, taking off with absolutely uh, no advanced blocking of any type. Right? Somebody was somewhere where they shouldn't have been, and it might have been Harbaugh. Designed by an unlicensed architect. Second down and nine at the 33-yard line. Look out. Pressure again. Now Harbaugh steps up and turns a sack into a gain as he gets out to the 38. It'll be third and four. Del Rio with the tackle. This has been a thing of beauty by the Vikings defense tonight. They have just collapsed the pocket every time Harbaugh has attempted to pass. He has either had to scramble for his life or he's stayed in the pocket, delivered the football, and, and taken some big-time shots. And again, you see he really has no alternative but to try to make something happen. Solid, solid work by Tony Dungy's defense. Third down and four. Gentry in motion. Bears trying to convert on third down for the first time in the game. Catch is made up at the 44. Terrific catch by Wendell Davis, and that's enough for a first down. Merriweather and McMillan right there with him. It's a great play by Harbaugh and a great play by Davis. But again, Harbaugh under unbelievable pressure. He had to wait until Davis cleared there. Davis with the hand up. And Harbaugh, meanwhile, was buried after he delivered the ball, but Davis with a fine catch. Oh, that's pretty. That's nice work by Wendell Davis. 
Harbaugh had to wait until he uncovered. He'd already been hit and by Dolman. Goes. He'd already been hit by Dolman when he threw that ball. How's that for some physical mm -hmm. strength? First and ten at the 45. Nine, ten to go. Third quarter. Bikes by 18. This is Muster making the catch. He's bumped out of bounds at the 49 of Minnesota by Todd Scott. Bears holding the edge in that department, but the turnovers have been hugely costly to the Chicago Bears tonight. Uh, one of them, a turnover, but an exception on the part of Jack Del Rio that was turned instantly into seven points. And the Darren Lewis fumble at the 32-yard line, cast in by the Vikings on the ensuing drive. Anderson takes it to the 45-yard line, is a little short of the first down. It's going to set up a third and one. A little trap play employed by the Bears against the quick charging front four of the Minnesota Vikings and it can be effective because they do a lot of slashing and attacking with that front four and the trap is usually pretty effective against it. Well this is a Bear team that can score points. They have been ringing the bell with some regularity so far this year and with eight minutes left in the third quarter there's still plenty of time but they don't they can't waste many of their possessions. Mm -hmm. And this is a prime example. They've moved into Viking territory. The Bears desperately need a touchdown, and they just can't let many of them get away. Third down and one. There's the fake. Over the middle, the catch is made at the 37-yard line by the tight end, Keith Jennings, for a big first down. There's Jennings, who, you know, for a guy who really, when he comes out onto the field at 6'4", 265, you say, well, here's just a tackle playing tight end, but... 14 receptions on the air coming into tonight's game and the, the guy's pretty light on his feet. He's got soft hands and that time I think realizing his team's predicament here very very cautious in his going down and making a big target for Harbaugh. You know, it's hard to believe he was a wide receiver at Clemson. Mm -hmm. and what, uh, I'd like to see what their offensive line looks like <laughs> if their receivers were that thing. First and 10 Chicago at the 36 yard line with Davis in motion. They fake the end around the pressure is on but the pass gets away into the hands of Muster and he takes it to the 30 yard line. Carlos Jenkins makes the hit. Little fake reverse and a little screen back to the weak side to Brad Muster and it's set up pretty good but again the quickness of the Minnesota Vikings defense closed it off of the short game. Little fake reverse there. Screen setting up. Buster gets one block, but again, Carlos Jenkins, Jenkins back quickly to make the tackle. Second and fourth to 30, six and a half left third quarter, 21-3 Vikings. Fake toss and then the give to Buster, and he gets knocked down after a gain of one. That's uh, Mike Merriweather in the middle of the action. Merriweather's the guy. Merriweather still holds the record for most sacks by a Steeler. And then he sat out that one season in a contract dispute, thought about retiring, and has uh, reemerged as a key factor in Minnesota's very potent defense. He missed all of 88, and the Vikings gave up the number one draft pick to get him. And, of course, he's reunited, as I mentioned earlier, with Tony Dungy, who was his defensive coordinator in the mid-'80s with the Steelers. Third and three, just inside the 30. And... John Randall came across the line. Well, somebody moved on the Chicago offensive line. I think this is going to be a false start against the Bears. And that's <laughs> may have been Jerry Fontenot, the center, who can be offside. False start on the center of the offensive team, simulating the start of a snap. Five yards, still third down. Now... When you're the man, there, now let's look at the middle. There's Fontenot. Now, when you're the man snapping the ball, I need an explanation of how you can rock back. I mean, you're either snapping the ball or you're not snapping the ball. That, that's something highly unusual, where you'll see the center make a false start without snapping the ball. Turns a third and three into a third and eight. Oh. And Harbaugh has it. Intercepted by Del Rio off the Merriweather deflection. He's tackled by Davis, and they turn it over again, and Dolman forced the issue with the pressure on Harbaugh. 
I wonder if Mark Rippon is watching tonight because what the Vikings did to Rippon a week ago, they're doing to Harbaugh tonight. They're not sacking him that many times, but they are hitting him on every play. And he just gets hammered once again by Dolman. And that could have been that could have been an injury hit there. But he had to get rid of it before he wanted to. Do. And we get another turnover. The kind of year he had three years ago when he chopped up 21 sacks back in 1989. That's, of course, is when he had Keith Millard on the inside. They moved John Randall there now, and he gets the kind of pressure on the inside that frees up Chris Goldman to have another great year. Pump fake on first down from the 31, and that's deflected. Incomplete, intended for Roger Cray over the middle. Second down and 10, with 5.18 left in the third quarter, and Minnesota leading 21 to 3. Jack Del Rio tonight, well, he's been in the league since 85. He had three interceptions in seven seasons, and then two in the last hour and 15 minutes or so. <laughs> well, he's picked his spot pretty well on Monday Night Football, and uh, the game of the year to this point for both of these teams. Good timing for Jack. And his Trojans, meanwhile, are moving up in the polls. Second and 10, Gannon going deep, and the catch is made inside the 40 by Joe Johnson. For a long gain and a first down, 38 yards, tackled by Wolford. We talked about how much and how many teams Jack Del Rio has been. Joe Johnson has been around a little bit, too. Most recently with the Redskins, but former Notre Dame star just gets away from Donald Wolford and then laid up there beautifully by Gannon. Boy, that was a nice move he put on Wolford. Subtle with the fake to the inside of the field and then back to the outside. Then he'll fought it, bit it all the way. First down to the 32-yard line. Gannon. Just he moves. Chased by Perry again. Bridge falls down. And Gannon, looking for all the world like Steve Young, I suppose, turns it into a nice game. But yeah. again, there's nothing frantic about Gannon on that. He knew exactly where he was. He has great presence when he's moving around. He has a wonderful feel about where he is. Superb athlete. We talked about it all night, but he just kind of moves around. He looks a little like Steve Young. Nothing frantic. Slides out here a little bit. A little trouble here. I'll just come back here for a moment. Bridge blows by. Creates a draft. Pretty good display of athleticism by Rich Gannon. Well, another guy who would be real proud of that would be Parkinson. Craig takes it to the 21. Well, Fran will still be running around. You know, the, the funny thing is we talked about this storied rivalry and the frustration evident on the bear sideline, but Tarkenton made his debut in the game in which these teams faced each other for the very first time. The Vikes an expansion team. The Bears were a longtime franchise in 61, and Fran threw for four touchdowns, and Minnesota upset Chicago 37-13. to 13. Oh, that was on his way to Canton, Ohio. Yep. Came off the bench to do that. You're right, Al. The Georgia Peach. First down from the 20-yard line. Gannon. Too deep. Picked off out of the end zone. Fain made the catch, but well out of the end zone. First card to the intended receiver. Second down. And, and I think there's a good example of what Dennis Green was talking to us uh, about last night when he was talking about Gannon, how he's constantly working on him, saying the only part of his game that really needs to improve is, again, his trying to force and make things happen. He, and he, he had a simple explanation. He said, Rich, not every play will work. Some of them are just failures. And that's, that, that was just a good example of not forcing the issue. Throw the ball away. You get another shot right here. Second and ten. Gannon. And that catch is made out of the end zone. That's a spectacular grab by Chris Carter. And again, Fain with the coverage. But he was clearly out. Third down. What is it about the end zone and Chris Carter? Talk about the two of them getting together and bringing out the best. Chris Carter, whenever he gets an opportunity to run a pattern in the end zone, normally comes up with stuff like this. Look at him go over the top and take that ball away. I mean, he's well out of bounds, but that really shouldn't 
uh, you should still enjoy and admire what he did as far as using his hands to get the football. Third and ten at the 20 yard line. And the catch is made oh. by Chris Carter at the six yard line. And what do you think the Eagles are thinking right now? You think they might be able to use Chris Carter? Yeah, I think so. That was a great catch. It showed you the ability of Chris Carter at the catch in the end zone. He's 6'3 and weighs almost 200 pounds, but he has great agility. He can go up and bring the ball down in the end zone. He makes the diving catch here over the middle. Couldn't ask for more from a wide receiver than you get from Chris Carter. Vince Tobin watching his defense get shredded on this drive. First and goal at the six. Here's Craig on a sweep, turns it back inside and takes it to the three and then gets buried by a trio and then a quartet of bears. The quartet bridge. was the bridge. The bridge came flying in there uh, <laughs> and, and a flag down. Well after the fact. This is going to go against the Vikings, but the bridge came sailing over the top there uh, well after the play. Roger Craig trying the right side. Making the right move, yep. cutting it back. And a good solid hit there by Singletary first. Here comes the late arriving refrigerator. Number 76, 10 yard penalty. Repeat the down, first down. Tim Irwin, the right tackle, gets flagged for the hold again. Watch Craig being driven backwards, and here comes the fridge. <laughs> That's got to feel like a refrigerator landing on top of you. Unfortunately, he landed on top of his own guys. <laughs> First and goal at the 15-yard line. Craig goes nowhere. He is tackled at the line of scrimmage by Trace Armstrong. Haven't called his name much tonight. Second and goal. Dennis Green. Two unusual college coaching experiences. Unusual in the sense that he coached at Northwestern and Stanford. Two schools a little better known for academics than athletics. Different types of programs. Interesting to Al, and he improved with each year that he was at either school. Second and goal at the 15. Gannon. And with the receivers covered, he still is able to step up and out of bounds at the 11-yard line. Picks up four. Run out by Roper. And we talked about how Gannon is beginning to do the things that Dennis Green wants him to do, and that is not try to win it up with every play on every time he goes back to throw the football. But he also he got the feeling of confidence when Dennis Green came in. He got rid of Wade Wilson. He knows that he is the starter. There's no controversy over quarterback with the Minnesota Vikings. It is Rich Gannon's his job, and it makes it a lot easier to handle all the things that you have to do to develop into a great quarterback. Third and goal at the 11-yard line. His line does a beautiful job again. And the pass is incomplete, intended for Carter. One big difference between these teams tonight. Gannon's had a lot of time to throw, and Harbaugh's had next to none. It, that's a, it has been just a fine job by the Viking offensive line. You're right. They have controlled the Chicago Bears up front. The running game when they had to, and especially pass protection. Oof. Talk about a nightmare. Again, Gannon just threw that ball away, though. He did not try to force it into the crowd. Save the interception, and now it's the opportunity for the three. This is a 28-yard quad reveille attempt. Held by Gannon. Kick is perfect. 101 remaining in the third quarter in Chicago, where the Vikings extend their lead to 24 to 3. A very happy 13th wedding anniversary to Dan Deardorff and our sympathies to Debbie Deardorff. Mm. What a princess. I find that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Barney and his <laughs> friends. You talk about the goof troop. Yes. Yes. Well, yes, today's our anniversary. And, I'm, <laughs> and you presented I'm, with a beautiful. I'm glad she's picking. Heart. That's right. I'm glad she's picking up my options. Yes. Merlin Olsen calls and wants to know if you need some flowers. <laughs> I need a new picture, obviously, <laughs> after that. Reveille's kick is taken at the four. Here's Dennis Gentry with 
Not a lot of space, and he takes it out to the 19-yard line and goes down to the COI Church with 49 seconds remaining in the third quarter. Third quarter winding down, and the Vikings trying to take a two-game lead in the NFC Central. We built this business. I hit the brakes. You know they're anti-lock brakes. It was close, but we stopped in time. Trees. Dad says they make good things from trees. After my accident, they advanced my insurance benefits and built me a ramp and got me back on my feet. We built this business to build your dreams. Things you never heard about a brand cereal before. Wow. If you've never heard this about a brand cereal, try Kellogg's Frosted Brand. It's different. It's lightly frosted. And it's crunchy. So it tastes delicious. Kellogg's Frosted Brand. It sure doesn't sound like brand. Oh, one more thing you never heard. You know that's brand you're eating. I know. It's great. Our instructions had an error, and a thousand orders were due Friday. With the speed of a Xerox digital color copier, you'll get this order on the road again. Intelligent color for any document, only from Xerox. Putting it together. We'd like color in our copies, but what small business can afford it? With Xerox Highlight Color, concerns about the cost of color disappear with just a touch. Intelligent color for any document, only from Xerox. Putting it together. Dennis Green, born, raised Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Went to school at Iowa, was a running back there. And since he's a very loyal guy, too, don't you, uh, Al, Darren Nelson, who was a great star at Stanford, set a Stanford rushing record. I don't know, maybe if he were on a different team, he might, might not still be around, but he played for Denny Green. He is around. And it's uh, helped to recruit him at Stanford Then coached him. We brought in Frank Gilliam, the guy that recruited him to play at Iowa as a personnel man. First down to 19, and this has been pretty much the story of Harbaugh's night. I mean, the whole line comes in to Decker, led by John Randall. So it's not a pretty thing today. Well. Not often you'll see a defensive line terrorize an offensive team the way the Vikings have tonight. Perfect verb. Terrorize. It's and <laughs> the Bears fall farther and farther behind and will face a fourth quarter of, of a, a bear offensive line that's struggling against a Viking defensive line that is just going for the kill on every play. Well, Jahowski couldn't even hold Randall, even though he tried. Draw play on second and 18, and Darren Lewis to the 15-yard line. And a, and a draw on second and 18 is the NFL's version of a white flag. I mean, it's, it's acknowledging we can't hold them out, and there's John Tierlink. The defensive line coach in Viking land, and they are a reflection of his personality. End of the third. Back we come with Monday Night Football after this from our ABC station. Thursday. Al Noga had the wind knocked out of him last play third quarter. He's up and at him and all right. And as we start the fourth quarter, his spot is taken by Roy Barker along the defensive front. Third down and 14 out of the shotgun for Jim Harbaugh. Little screen Ooh, for Lewis. And he takes it up to the 27, but he's still short of the first down. Carlos Jenkins makes the hit. But the Bears will have to punt. Well, if they hadn't have used their fake punt last week against Green Bay, what a time to come up with it. A well, a fake punt that, as it turns out, was an illegal play several fronts because uh, among other things you cannot have anybody within five yards of your team bench and if you didn't see the play Mark Green stood near the sideline caught the pass from Gardaki and it was the key play of the game his punt is fair caught here by Anthony Parker at the 40 yard line we also had a couple of people moving at the same time in motion yep is not allowed Mike Holmgren, the Green Bay coach, not too happy about it, but that's history. 
Bears won it, but tonight they're trailing by 21. That has belonged to the Minnesota Vikings. Well, it's not that cold. It's keep dropping, though. They expect it to be in the 20s later tonight. They expect it to be in the uh, 20 belows. It's a lot colder when you're losing, too. That's true. First and 10 at the 40 yard line. Gannon. Oh, oh, oh wide open is Steve Jordan. And Jordan gets a tremendous block and goes in for the touchdown. And Chris Carter with the block. He puts the hammer on Mark Carrier, peeling back. And Chris Carter looked like somebody from Ohio State blocking downfield on that play. I mean, a devastating hit on Mark Carrier. Well, Steve Jordan, though, he is one of the great tight ends ever to play this game. And Carrier is number 20. There's Chris Carter, and see you later, Carrier. But look at the speed that Jordan, who has been out for the past couple of weeks with a sore ankle, to get into the end zone. This is 423rd reception. Mike Ditka is in the Hall of Fame. 427. Right on the edge of being an illegal block. It's right there. It was close. It was a beauty, but it was legit. Yep. Reves with a point after, and the Minnesota Vikings are simply putting an exclamation point on this one. I think they're also putting an exclamation point on the central division of the NFC. They own it. Jordan again. Six consecutive Pro Bowls. You see why. Get your blood pumping. Hers too. Unless, of course, you stink. You don't have to if you use an old spice, because the pump's concentrated, and it puts more power on your pit than the leading aerosol deodorant. So it works, big time. The proof? Save your strength. She's all I need, a pump from Old Spice. Don't let the size fool you. Give it a shot. For great odor protection, demand proof, not promises. These are a lot of folks leaving Soldier Field with their team down 31 to 3. When you go back to the beginning of the fourth quarter in that game in Minnesota four weeks ago, and the first three quarters and a minute tonight, in the last 61 minutes of play between these two teams, Minnesota has outscored Chicago 52 to 3. This is a town that is going to, I think, be in a collective depression tomorrow. I mean, the excitement level here in Chicago was just at a fever pitch before this game. The revenge factor of what happened up at the Metrodome, realizing that if the Bears won this game tonight, that they'd be tied for first place. Uh, a very astute football town knew what was at stake. And for their team to be so thoroughly dominated by the Vikings is going to send Chicago into a funk that they won't recover from for a while. Well, they are very astute, uh, the fans here in Chicago. They, they know full well, as we said earlier, that they're probably the only one playoff team come from the Central Division because of the way it's falling out. And that will be the Central Division champion. And the Bears will be in deep trouble after tonight. First and 10, Chicago at the 20-yard line. Harbaugh has time for one of the rare times tonight and hits Waddle for a nine-yard gain, and he's tackled by Van Waiters. And who would have believed that early in the fourth quarter, Minnesota would be able to get some action in for their reserves. Waiters backs up Carlos Jenkins. Again, it's not a big football team. It's, as we have witnessed tonight, it's a very quick team, and particularly that front four. Chicago, meanwhile, Wojciechowski and Stan Thomas, the backup tackles are in. That play was good enough for a first down at nine-yard gain with a uh, fortuitous spot. was put at the 30-yard line. It turned out to be a 10-yard gain in the first down. Catch is made at the 34-yard line by... Wendell Davis, and he takes it to the 37. It'll be second down and three. And Harbaugh is hammered again. Al Noga still in the ball game, slow to get up, but well, there's a guy that's going to spend the majority of his day tomorrow in a hot bath. You know, Harbaugh looking to the sideline, and before the play could be sent in, there's a hit he takes. 
from Noga, but before he could get the play, Greg Landry wanted to see if he could call another pass play for Harbaugh. Harbaugh wincing in pain, and Greg Landry didn't know what to call. Harbaugh tried to speed it up. On second and three, it's a first down for Darren Lewis as he takes the ball to the Minnesota 47-yard line with 12-15 remaining. I think that's the type of work that Greg Landry and Mike Ditka have expected to see from Darren Lewis. Did you notice the explosion, the quickness, the, the lateral burst, and then making the decision to go upfield? That, that was a nice-looking run by Darren Lewis, the talented one from A&M down in Texas. You know, he gained over 5,000 oh. yards rushing at A&M. Set a Southwest Conference record. And he can make things happen. Unfortunately, his fumble early in the ballgame hurt the Bears. Harbaugh decked again. Randall finished off by Dolman. Randall is uh, heavy into celebration tonight. Well, the only drama left in this one is Ditka's post-game press conference. And they have been tempestuous as of late. Well, Mike has suspended his uh, Monday press conferences, saying that everything he has to say, he'll say after the ball game, and saying, I've been too accessible to the media in this town, and I'm, I'm going to cut back. Second down to 12. And Harbaugh goes down at the 45-yard line. Oh, and there's, there's a flag. I think Stan Thomas came in after Harbaugh hit the deck and, and, and put a pop on one of the Vikings, and he's going to get flagged for a, for a personal foul, I would suspect. I think he hits Jack Del Rio. Yeah. And he was maintaining that he was just blocking for Harbaugh. Personal foul. Unnecessary roughness. On number 60. The offense on number 60. See, Harbaugh's down. The play's over. <laughs> it is a little late. And that is a very late hit. And one of his better hits of the night, though. Trying to make something happen. Stan Thomas, a number one draft choice that isn't a starter and sometimes feels the pressure that people are thinking of him as a, as a failure. I, I don't think that's the case. This, this guy's going to develop into a good offensive lineman here in the National Football League. And, well, Chris Dolman putting a whole bag of frustrations on him tonight. Well, He's spinning him around like a top. Harbaugh goes incomplete. Henry Thomas. Henry Thomas put the pressure on that time. <laughs> well, there's no flag. No flag, but Dolman that time was tackled by Stan Thomas. It'll be third down and 23. Uh, let's take a look at this one if we can. Stan Thomas is in there playing left tackle. Number 60. Let's watch this work against Dolman. You see if he, you think he held it. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, maybe a little. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> oh, maybe. Beautiful just, hole. Maybe just a hand. And a little. <laughs> Kung Fu. A little bit of everything. Third and 23. There's a flag. <laughs> <laughs> the flag was near Thomas. I don't know if it's on him or not. As Lewis makes the catch. Well, take your pick. Somebody. Yeah. Thomas was trying to leg whip Dolman that time. Audrey McMillan is the injured Viking meanwhile. A hand tack tells us. Illegal use of the hands, number 57 on the offense. Penley is declined. Fourth down. Is Tom Thayer. McMillan gets up and goes off. They get Thayer on the far side of the ball for the illegal use of hands, but boy, what a tough night for the Bears. 31 to 3, Minnesota. They're going to lead by two, and in effect, a three game lead with half the season gone. Anthony Parker back to receive the kick from Gardaki. Parker just lets it bounce at the 20, and it's down at the 23-yard line by Mark Rodenhauser. And that's where the Chicago Bears will take over with 10-20 left. And 
Minnesota up by 28. Line up the Saturday. Check your local listings for the game in your area. Highlighted by Washington against Arizona. Huskies number one in the country. And uh, if you want to see one of the other games not available in your area, call your cable operator. It may be available to you on pay-per-view as Terry Allen takes the ball up to the 27-yard line. Gain of about three. We started to talk about Ditka before and Mike's future. He's in the second year of a three-year contract. We asked him flat out last night if he's coming back next year. He initially said, I don't know if I'll be back next year. I don't want to be run out of town. And then about 10 minutes later, he said, he, he broke off whatever conversation we were having at that point and said, I'll be back next year. Well, he said, I, I'm not going to be run out of this town by a writer. Mm -hmm. Mike is, uh, has some ongoing warfare with some members of the press here in Chicago, and uh, there are hard feelings all the way around. And it's a very strained relationship right now with, with Ditka and the media. Second and five, and it's Allen taking it up to the 30-yard line. It's been a brutal year for him, starting off with an unauthorized biography that got into his family. And Mike, while he's very public in many ways, is also very private about his family. He had problems with Ed Bradovich, a former teammate of his. They didn't see eye to eye, and Bradovich didn't think that he handled the hardball thing as he should have. It's been a very difficult year for him, and uh, he reacts emotionally to everything. And and again, a situation like the Bears are in this year, there's going to be a lot of things that are going to cause him to react. Yep. Mike Ditka is a very complex man in many ways, but the one thing you have to say about him, he is a doggone good football coach. This, this is not, I mean, these two teams on the field tonight, the Minnesota Vikings are a more talented team than the Chicago Bears. Mm -hmm. And I think Chicago sometimes has an unrealistic expectation of the Chicago Bears. Uh, I think the Super Bowl of 1985 they think is an annual event here in Chicago. This is not a football team that is anywhere near the talent level of the 85 Bears. I think you said it best when you called Ditka a very complex man and you know he's got to put up with among other things dime store psychologists around the country putting him on the couch. Well it's time the, after time. It's the price you pay sometimes for being as public a figure as Mike Ditka. I mean, uh, he is a very exposed man here in Chicago. His commercial endorsements, uh, restaurants, uh, in many ways, we talked about this early on in the show, he is Chicago. I mean, if Michael Jordan is the athlete that dominates this town, in many ways, Mike Ditka is the man who symbolizes Chicago and the work ethic of this town and, and, and what it stands for. And, and as often happens, when you are that large, when you are that successful and that popular, many people anticipate your downfall and look forward to it with glee and delight. And so the Ditka's detractors are, are lining up, waiting to get a piece of the action. Well, winning normally shuts your detractors up, so things have been relatively copacetic here since the Harbaugh incident. They had won two games, but they had beaten Tan Tampa Bay and Green Bay. Newsom to the 25-yard line. Waddle to run his back. And Waddle loses the football. There's a marker down back at the 26. In fact, there are two as the play ends up at about the 46-yard line. Two flags down. Waddle very sure-handed. They like him back on a night like tonight with a lot of wind and there's the ball use of the hand. popping loose. Block in the back. Mike Merriweather turned. strips the ball and it pops First right down. up in the air to David Tate. But number 24. They're saying that back at the point where Waddle sprung loose, Richard Fain made an illegal block to the back and back it comes and is you can see we have a new quarterback, PT e. Willis. PT e. Willis. It doesn't stand for prime time. Peter Tom Willis, third year, Florida State. Well, but the school's the same. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Teammate of uh, Deion Sanders. Got about a half a dozen attempts as a mop-up quarterback for Harbaugh this far this season. 
Well, the spot to come into, though. This uh, play never happened because the whistles were blowing before the snap. It's always a thrill to come off the bench when you're down 31 to 3 on a very cold night. Your offensive line is struggling, and the enemy across the line of scrimmage is working on their stats. You as a target. Ball start, offense number 60 prior to the snap. Five yard penalty, still first down. I think Diana Ditka is the only one that has kept this all in the right perspective, at least a little humorous about it. They talked to her about her husband not speaking with the press. Is, I understand that. He hasn't talked to me in 15 years. She's a wonderful strength, though, for Mike Ditka, who's going through a very difficult time. First and 15 at the 11-yard line. And that's through the hands of Lewis, into the hands of Carlos Jenkins, and another touchdown on a dive by right, Carlos. Taking a page out of Brian Mitchell's entry into the end zone last night. Oh, I think we got something <laughs> going. We may see a lot of that. Well, this is uh, running out of adjectives. <laughs> Abysmal is offered up by Ken Wolf, our producer. And, and since Kenny graduated from Harvard, yeah, I I'll suppose we'll accept it. That's right. And it's the fourth largest word we've used tonight. <laughs> I'll start it off with humongous. <laughs> and we go we down as Peter Tom Willis is, but it was not his mistake. Darren Lewis had it right in the hands. Went to equanimity. That's exactly right. And this is the type of babble you get when it's 37 <laughs> to 3, working on 38. <laughs> well, this one is now officially <laughs> over. Yeah. Over at 38 to 3. <laughs> That's right. Yes, it is. <laughs> That's exactly right. 824 <laughs> left. That's right. Much levity as we are displaying the booth. It is really tough on... The big bear walking the sidelines, Mike Ditka. That's our game next week. We'll go to the Georgia Dome. The 49ers upset yesterday by Phoenix, and we'll have Steve Young back, you would think, after being uh, riddled with the flu yesterday. And the Atlanta Falcons, who have lost Chris Miller, so Billy Joe Tolliver and the former Viking Wade Wilson are the guys who will have to leave the Falcons now with Andre Risen and Deion Sanders and company, and we'll see them all next Monday night. 49ers blew away the Falcons early on, 56 to something, and of course Atlanta will be looking for a little bit of revenge. Wasn't that the game where the uh, Falcons went out displaying the uh, their version of a, of a California trophy because of the success that they'd had the year before against the team from California, and that backfired. Mm -hmm. Not a good idea. 38 to 3 before what is now a uh, very sparse gathering at Soldier Field. Plenty of good seats available if you're just tuning in. A group of cameramen and talented technicians and announcers and team uh, now starting to outnumber the remaining fans. Well, the largest margin of victory in this series for the uh, Vikings would be 31 points back in 1969. So this is the biggest round at the moment in terms of a Minnesota win in the history of the series. And so we urge you now to stay tuned to see if that will hold. Don't touch that dial. Minnesota 24 points off Chicago turnovers tonight. Gervais's check is dropped at the five by Darren Lewis. And then he gets dropped at the 14-yard line, and here comes a flag from Hansack. You know, we talked to Dennis Green last night, and we asked him what a win under these circumstances would mean to his team at this point. I think what it means is that we're really tough, hard-nosed guys that can, that can really go the distance. Now, this is something we emphasize in training camp, and now we're going to have a chance to see exactly how far it goes. We can go on the football field and play in another place, in another stadium, against a crowd, against everybody else, and be really tight as a football team. It's our challenge for teamwork. Well, they have met the challenge tonight in spades, is what they've done, because this team... Leading 38 to 3, we'll have a two game lead, in effect, a three game lead in the conference in the division because they'll have the tiebreaker advantage. And when you look at Minnesota's schedule, oh, it's tough, Al. You got, well, outside of their division, 
Houston, Philadelphia, San Francisco, and Pittsburgh. Could have, could have been a big win here tonight. Well, as you look at their schedule, they'll, go to, they'll be favored at Tampa Bay. They'll play Houston at home, and they should be favored to win that game right now. They've got Cleveland at home, favored there. At the Rams, probably favored. At Philly, who knows where they, the Eagles will be at that point. San Francisco at home, then at Pittsburgh and Green Bay at home. It's and and when you factor in the quality of football that the Vikings are playing right now, I mean it's I, I, I don't see any scenario where the Bears come back and, and, and stage some sort of a miracle second half coupled with a Viking collapse. I mean this is the uh, the team that's going to win the Central Division of the NFC and along with it serious uh, coach of the year considerations for Dennis Green if their second half in any way resembles the first half. Kickoff again taken at the two yard line by Gentry. Up to the 29. That coach of the year uh, battle featuring a couple of rookies now. <laughs> Dennis Green and Power Power in Pittsburgh. He's got his uh, he's got his Steelers at six and two as well. And you've got Minnesota at Pittsburgh on December 20th. That might be the coach of the year bowl. <laughs> yes. Speaking of Philadelphia, interesting decision by Richie Kotite, who is going to announce today that he is going to start Jim McMahon this weekend, and Randall Cunningham goes down. 8:02 left, 38 to three, Minnesota. Willis sets up the screen. This is Mark Green. And Green loses the football, but it is still Chicago's ball. Headlines been coming right in to say he was down. 36-yard line will be the spot, and Vinci Glenn covers the football, but uh, it won't count. How about? While we're discussing the Philadelphia Eagles, how about a team that when we saw them absolutely take apart the Cowboys? Let's look at it here again. Oh, and that is a fumble. You can see the ball came out well before he hits the ground. But the Eagles, when we saw them for the only time this year, manhandled the Cowboys. It's <laughs> they haven't played any football that's resembled that game yet. Mark Green takes it to the 50 yard line. A real question mark surrounding the, the play of the Eagles since that game uh, that Monday night. Offense goes oh. south. How do you figure? Yeah, how do you figure? I mean, they were a team that was just everything they were doing was right. Yep. And very little has gone right for them since. Meanwhile, now both teams here tonight are trying to run the clock out. Mark Green, and along with Darren Lewis. Backups seeing action along with Peter Tom Willis and Ferris content for now to keep it on the ground. Willis goes incomplete to the near side intended for Gentry with 6.28 to play. Well, things have gotten very tight, much more interesting in the last couple of weeks. The league has to love it. I mean, all of a sudden you've got battles coming out of nowhere in most of the divisions. How about the New Orleans Saints? Is that the quietest? Six and two. I mean, uh, it's time to pay attention to that team. A lot of attention. It was kind of easing along. We got them coming up very not too far down the road against Washington, against the uh, the Saints at the end of November, uh, against the Redskins. Gannon and Novoselsky enjoying a breather. Going to be a happy flight back to Minnesota for this crew as Wendell Davis makes the catch at the 40-yard line of the Vikings. And of course, with you mentioned the Saints, Al the. It's the same old story in New Orleans. Outstanding defense. I mean, they are once again just making it tough to score. And that ought to be uh, that ought to be a good game with the Redskins down there. That's yeah. That's an interesting matchup. And how do you figure Washington? I mean, all of a sudden uh, the stumbling start, and they look like they might be the the best team in the league after the the win against Denver, the victory over Philadelphia. I get shot down last night. What the Redskins, what the Redskins are undergoing here in 1992, I think just makes people who really know and, and, and follow the game closely appreciate teams that successfully have defended their championship. 
I mean, to win a Super Bowl and then come back and do it again the following year amidst all of the hoopla that surrounds winning a Super Bowl, new contracts and everything else, uh, I think it's just indicative of how difficult it is to do what the Reds Redskins are undergoing this year. <laughs> Second and three at the 32-yard line as Willis throws it behind Green, and that's incomplete, covered on the play by Todd Scott. Well, Todd Scott, if you look at this Minnesota season, this guy, uh, he's the fulcrum because it was his interception in the Chicago game on the Harbaugh Audible that turned that game around. And now, of course, Minnesota has taken that, and they've uh, extended that into a big lead in this division. Sixth-round draft pick, and one of those Jerry Reichow finds that have turned into a good football player, replaced Joey Browner at one of the key spots and has made some big plays for them. Yeah, five interceptions on the year. That's, that's not bad. Third and three, and they give it the green on a sweep. He's got three guys out in front. That's, the, I guess, the perfect way to run a sweep when you've got three guys leading the way. He takes it to the 14. Now we're going to see the Viking defense really bear down. I mean, this is a case where they just don't want to let the Bears get in the end zone. They're pitching a touchdown shutout. And this is a play you don't see too much anymore. Both guards out in front. A power sweep. Yeah, it's just a, almost a thing of the past with the great defensive team speed you see around the NFL these days. Like O.J. Simpson and the Trojans. <laughs> that's Lombardi special. That's a 49 that like power. Fuzzy yeah, Thurston and Jerry Kramer out front with Jimmy Taylor yeah. and Horner. Yep. Carly nearly at the interception. Second down. Well, Viking defense, even though they lost to the Washington Redskins last week, 15 to 13, they did not give up a touchdown. They gave up five field goals, but if they could pull that off tonight, that would be rather impressive. Not allowing a touchdown to Washington and uh, then to the Bears, and that could have been picked off very easily by Carl Lee, the multiple Pro Bowl defensive back for the Vikings. Second and ten. Willis throwing for the end zone touchdown. Wendell Davis. I can see it tomorrow. <laughs> Peter Tom Willis over Jim Harbaugh. Davis scores a touchdown and the guy holds up a waddle for president sign. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Makes perfect sense. Whatever. And yeah, when it's 38 to 9, you can hang up any sign you want. <laughs> Felix Wright, number 22, is the DB in coverage, and he looked mesmerized when Wendell Davis came at him and then broke to the corner. <laughs> Butler. Extra point. 414 remaining, and the Vikings. Now lead it by a score of 38 to 10. PT for a TD. And well, go football. Felix Wright caught looking inside. And Wendell Davis having a pretty good year with the touchdown for the Bears. And if the Bears can somehow score four touchdowns here in the next four minutes, we can go to overtime. <laughs> Harbaugh has been so durable over the past few years that Peter Tom Willis, a third-round draft pick in 1990, has played very little. At 20 attempts a year ago, six this year, most of them in a mop-up operation. Frank, I can't believe Dan smells overtime again. Right? Oh, you know it. It's always got a major league nose over here. All you have to do is just add him up. 17, 24, 31, 38. See, guys, I think, OT. We, I think we've run out of notes here. Did I tell you that uh, Malibu Kelly Hayes moved to Aspen? We heard that. Which we is heard that. the Rockies are getting an unprecedented snowfall there. According to Kelly, the ski areas are even thinking about opening early in the Rockies. Only the best ski areas in the world. Oh, boy. Now, what can I pop here? <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I said that. <laughs> That's, uh, this is, <laughs> that's your friendly Barnes and Noble. <laughs> yeah, this is a surreal game, way for this game. I mean, you look at the, the, the stands. Here it is, a huge game. 
tremendous buildup in Chicago, and, and it ends like this. But uh, the Minnesota Vikings have made it end like this because they have been. You think we'll have an onside down. kick? Uh, perhaps, Dan, uh, you're an analyst. You Oh, <laughs> what are you? <laughs> are we going to have an onside kick? I think so. I think so. Because you don't you don't score those four touchdowns to go to overtime without recovering the onside kick. That's Danny Abramowitz, the special teams coach of the Bears. And, and he is saying, hey, guys, we're probably going to have an onside kick. Let's get our onside kick detail out there. <laughs> and for the Vikings, they're going to have all their sure-handed types. The ball must travel 10 yards before the kicking team can recover. <laughs> 38 to 10, Minnesota leading it. There's quite a talent to do this, too. Kevin Butler pretty good at it. You make that thing bounce and then take couple of bounces pops high in the air and then you get those sure-handed receiver types going up after it. good analysis <laughs> there you oh are. look at this oh that that's a good looking play there that's that's a, that's a good looking play well that's yeah that fooled everybody the nearest one to recovering it was kevin <laughs> butler yeah. yep that goes with the rest of the night for Chicago, anyway. Mike's getting it at the 35. Happy flight home for Chris Dolman, Dennis Green. And the Vikings prepare to uh, head down to Florida next Sunday where they'll meet the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Sean Salisbury comes in at quarterback, Gannon Gunn. Salisbury. Fourth year out of USC. Logs a little time up the Canadian Football League. And they give it to Keith Henderson, the former 49er, and he rambles for a first down. Tackled by Ron Cox. It isn't true how you look at uh, this roster of the Vikings, and they come from all over the place. Uh, Salisbury was with Winnipeg. He was with the Colts for a while, with Seattle, and came here as a free agent. But they have gone out and picked up talent wherever they could find it. Nine plan B's we talked about earlier. Ten trades, they've made, ten free agents they have on the team. Seven trades that they've made. My feet are frozen. I've got some galoshes for you. That's color, not analysis. <laughs> Henderson picks up five to the 48-yard line. Tackled by Ron Rivera. You know, Henderson had a pretty good year last year with the 49ers, but he opened this year and fumbled the ball at three times the first three games, and he was 49er history. And, uh, well, he was history for a couple of reasons. Uh, that plus the emergence of Ricky Waters. Mm -hmm. And some emergence that has been. Mm -hmm. a Ricky Waters has come on and really really impressed a lot of people and we will see Ricky Waters next Monday at 9 Eastern 8 Central 7 Mountain and 6 Pacific well, what, what a lucky what a lucky promo on my part <laughs> second and five first visit to the Georgia Dome I'm looking forward to that Joe Johnson makes the catch and this should take us to the two-minute warning Joe you Johnson. are forewarned said earlier he's been around too. Bills Tampa Bay Washington All right. No, uh -oh. uh -oh. the uh, well, the Bears are taking a timeout. So, uh, they taking a timeout, and even the crowd doesn't like it. Whatever's left of this crowd. I mean, if you're going to stay around for this, why are you going to pull a timeout? The Bears actually took a timeout. They took a timeout. Chicago. This toddling town 
with a teetering football team at the moment. That's going to go four and four through the first half of the season. And the that's, that's really distressing for a team like Chicago for a number of reasons because this is a team that in years past has gotten off to great starts and had some problems down the stretch. Total yardage, well, not at all indicative of the disparity tonight between these two teams. A couple of turnovers uh, that were run back for touchdowns. The interceptions. Untimely fumbles and the rest. But it's been a pretty thorough beating in every facet of the game. Henderson. And that, I believe, will take us to the two-minute warning. Which it does. 38 to 10. Viking. Until now, some thought high maintenance was an unavoidable expense of high performance. Change is in sight. Introducing the North Star system by Cadillac with a 295 horsepower V8 engine so advanced, its first scheduled tune-up is 100,000 miles. So while others promise the world, Cadillac gives you the equivalent of a trip around it four times over. The North Star system by Cadillac, changing the way you think about American automobiles. with the driver we have we've got the best driver out there so it's it's a matter of, of the mechanics just not overlooking anything Al and I stay in uh, stay in constant uh, communication uh, during the race uh, I have to be aware of what he wants or needs you know at all times I think the small details are the uh, is what makes the difference between winning and running second The Vikings, 38 to 10 over the Bears. There's Olga. <laughs> Checked out as Jack Del Rio. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're that. on. You're on. Yeah, you got it. I hope you're a Nielsen family. Yes, we can read. Reason to celebrate in Viking land, certainly. And reason to celebrate here is. We're inside the two minutes. <laughs> Fourth quarter. Second and eight. Henderson takes it to the 31. It'll be third and one. And the Bears are going to take a timeout. Uh, well, they're looking over to see if they should take a timeout. And they do. Pretty sight for Chicago Bear fans and for Mike Ditka. This team was totally mauled tonight by the Minnesota Vikings, who are really in a makeover mode, if you will. These are interesting uh, timeouts. Ditka may be delaying his entrance to the post-game press conference. He may be trying to buy every minute he can before he has to go in and face the press. I think Ditka right now is probably musing about how nice it would be to coach in Pittsburgh where the newspapers are on strike. <laughs> Poor Bill Cower. I mean, here's a guy who should be basking in the glow of all of this adulation, and there are no newspapers. That's, that has been, that strike has been going on for how long now? Six months? Yeah. The whole baseball season. Yeah. Third and one for the Minnesota Vikings at the 31-yard line. Henderson takes it to the 30. Chris Zorich makes the tackle. Now the Bears out of timeouts. There's a great story, Chris Zorich. No, they, they still have one. Second-year guy from Notre Dame who's from the Chicago area here. And this is uh, the time of a ball game where interest is waning, but for somebody like Zorich, he's getting some minutes at 
ordinarily doesn't get, and uh, Alonzo Spellman is oh. in there too, Dan. Yeah. He of the low body fat. <laughs> Dorich is just low. We have, a, only... we have a measurement here. <laughs> oh. First down. There's Alonzo Spellman, number one draft pick out of Ohio State. And most people feel he's going to be a superstar yeah. for these Bears. Yeah, there it is. We showed Holy you that in the preseason. And 5.6% body fat. Alonzo's dad, Leon, was 6'8, is 6'8, 285 pounds. Alonzo's only 21. He's probably still growing. Yeah, he's only 6'4", 280. Alonzo, the runt of the family. <laughs> I'd like to be 6'4", 280 and have to look up to your dad. Asking for the keys to the car. They use him inside and outside. And like I say, a lot of promise. Second down and six on what uh, just might be the final play of the game. Henderson and Zorich whispering sweet nothings into his ear. Well, for the Vikings, they are for real. I think I'm going to the press conference. I mean, they are for real. This team is six and two. Dennis Green has just done a tremendous job. The Bears are four and four, and who knows what. This one is over. And we will be back at Soldier Field right after this. So, I see you changed your mind, huh? Well, the Camry was nice. Mm -hmm. And then I drove this. Yeah. Mileage is better. Really? And with the power, I'm telling you, it's like a sports car with room for the kids. It'll probably set you back, huh? About 3,000 less than the Camry. No kidding. No kidding. Well, what is it? The new Grand Am. It's a Pontiac. Really? It really looks nice. There it is, the Central Division standings, and with Minnesota beating Chicago twice this season, in effect, that's a three-game lead, and they are on their way to the Central Division Championship. Final score, 38-10. We'll talk to you next week from Atlanta. Till then, Al Michaels, Frank Gifford, Dan Deardorff. Good night from Chicago.